Hey, good morning, everyone. We'll resume hearing uh, number 07, submissions on the variation one um, promulgated by Selwyn District Council. And this morning we're hearing from Foodstuffs South Island Limited and Foodstuffs South Island Properties Limited. But before we do that, just from the 40 today reporting officer this morning, anything for us? Nothing further to the memo I circulated yesterday. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And just then, just um, in terms of the two matters not related to this hearing, but the legal opinion that we've requested from Council on Subdivision. Um, who's Council's solicitor in that regard? Uh, it's Kate Rogers yep. from DLA Piper. And I know it's early days yet, we only issued that minute yesterday, but has, has anyone been in contact with you? Uh, yes, I've requested it. I'm still waiting for a fee in and a time frame. Okay, lovely, thank you. And the second matter was the addendum report relating to the Lincoln hearing. Uh, yes, that's underway. Uh, Vicky Barker is preparing He's that. doing that one. Okay. All right, thanks very much for that. So good morning and welcome. So um, just before you start, I think you've definitely appeared before us before. So um, just to repeat what I always say, Dave, thanks very much for your pre-circulated material, legal submissions and evidence. We've read all of that material, so none of that needs to be read out loud to us. Um, and But as we proceed through the day, and the witnesses are welcome to summarise key points for us, or if they're happy that we have read everything, they can just go straight to questions. So maybe if we start with your legal submissions, um, and then we'll, we will have questions for you, definitely. And uh, well, we'll deal with that before proceeding to hear from your witnesses. Thank you, Commissioner. Them. You know, yeah. I've encouraged them to actually do summarise up front some of the key points um, in terms of this particular submission. Yeah. So in terms of uh, legal, um, you've obviously read my legal submissions and I just wanted to go through <clears throat> a couple of things really up front uh, with you all. One, I wanted to talk about some background and context and I think that's uh, particularly important uh, to this submission and so you'll have to bear with me as I whip through that. The other one I want to talk about is giving effect to policy 3D um, in particular. Mm -hmm. um, and then I noticed uh, Mr Cleary had raised some legal points um, on our submission, which I'll address briefly as well, um, in addition to what I've already provided from legal submission. So by way of background, and as you uh, referred to Chair, I have appeared before you now on at least two occasions in this process concerned about the proposed Salmon District Plan's responsiveness. Um, the first time was in August 2021. I'm sure this time is passing for you as well, um, but that's coming up two years ago. And the food stuff's identified at that time their proposed Salmon District Plan, that there was this incredible demand for supermarket offerings and inadequate provision in those plans that they were only provided for in the town centre zone and no other commercial mixed-use zones or outside any centres, and that they, they'd been searching um, and there was no space in those zones, um, despite those activities um, being permitted, and that there was otherwise no provisions to enable a supermarket. Um, it was submitted that to give effect to the requirements of the MPS on Doom development, the provisions of the plan must contribute to a well-functioning urban environment which enabled sites, suitable sites, both in terms of location and size, for business activities to be realised and supported by the associated policy framework. So objective three, um, as you would have heard over numerous uh, months, uh, that uh, tells us that business activities should be located in the areas of the urban environment where, the, where there is a demand. So I, I submitted um, through, you know, starting at the strategic hearings and moving through that, through this plan change process, of which this is a variation, that the Salwyn Council should step up and respond, can and should step up and respond directly to those NPS and urban development objectives. And Foodstuffs was happy to um, constructively work with the Salwyn District Council through that plan process to ensure adequate and appropriate provisions were achieved for business activities. 
So over the last two years, again, this is just by way of background for your context, foodstuffs is now secured land in Rolleston, um, of which we're talking about today, and in Lincoln, of which you've obviously released the memo to the council in, in order to provide for that much needed supermarket growth in Lincoln and Rolleston. It has completed the consent process for the Rolleston Pack and Save, which was completed after the submission period for this process. Um, and we have lodged a consent in Lincoln, which has been considered under the operative plan for an expansion of the supermarket in Lincoln. And we'll address you address that in another hearing process. So first stuff sees that the notification of variation one to incorporate medium density residential standards and to give effect to policy three is the correct avenue to secure appropriate commercial zones for its activities and its future activities. It seeks that to rezone, that it seeks to rezone a site which it owns in Rolleston, um, strategically located so close to town with a desperate need for activities on it um, and where it could provide for one other large retail activity located near the centre within the res residential catchment and able to provide for those operational and functional requirements which is not suited to the town centre zone is not surprising in the context of where we've come from on this journey and, and what you've been listening to us over these few years. So when Variation 1 was notified and a submission was lodged by foodstuffs, it owned the site here in Rolleston um, and it sought to rezone that. Um, we were in the middle of the consenting process, we'd not received a decision on the Rolleston pack and save at that time. But we clearly stated in our submission that we intend to establish a pack and site within the proposed Rolleston site on Levi Road, um, that we didn't consider the medium residential zone reflected the intended and future use of the whole site. And as such, foodstuffs considered it should be rezoned to an appropriate commercial zoning. Um, and the submission specifically stated that when changing the proposed Salmon District Plan to give effect to policy three, as variation one seeks to do, the Enabling Act allows the council to create new urban non-residential zones, and it referred to the Section 7E, 7 provision there. So foodstuffs also sought the removal of the proposed Rolleston site from the medium residential zone um, and the rezoning to an appropriate commercial zone to reflect the intended and future use and such further consequential amendments as may, may be required by that rezoning. It also sought any changes that would be required to the proposed Selwyn District Plan um, to address the matters raised, although the initial submissions were so broad that it didn't think that was going to be an issue. And it recorded that it wished to be heard and we would be happy to meet and discuss any matters raised in the submission with the council. Um, significant cost and time, as you know, I mean, you've, you've heard from many submitters, there's a huge cost and time to being involved in these processes. Um, it's incredibly important to certainty of, uh, of clients' businesses, and they spend a lot of money in presenting cases before you. Uh, what we had after we lodged the submission in our evidence three weeks ago, foodstuffs experts contacted council peer reviewers to see if there could be any reducing of issues and alignment so that we were in a position coming to the hearing today to have narrowed issues and evidence to present to you. Uh, and the peer reviewers were told, were told our experts um, that they hadn't been instructed on this matter. So having gone through the Rolleston Pack and Save process, um, which was a publicly notified process and for all respects had very little people involved, um, the direct neighbours across from the Levi Road who obviously had the written approval of the only adjoining land to the east and there was a developer and one of the submitter who have now, um, through the evidence of Mr Neverill, undertaken their development across that Lincoln Rolleston Road. Um, when we got to the end of that Rolleston Pack and Save process, the council peer reviewers through that process were all in agreement with our experts. Um, so the experts were aligned on every, every matter of technical expertise subject. And the only disagreement was a policy disagreement by the planning officer who considered and took a neutral position and decided that, um, that they did not see um, a reason for, you know, they were looking at the operative zone and not at the NPS and urban development and the commission obviously granted that consent. So you can imagine that I then anticipated, genuinely anticipated that the reason there was no um, evidence required was because the council has thrashed this out publicly. Um, we've obviously met with the council for the proposed MITRE 10 on the site and we were in a position where we thought the council was entirely comfortable with the rezoning on our site. So I received the reporting officer's memo yesterday, which recorded that no substantive evidence was provided in foodstuff submission and that the rebuttal evidence was provided too late in the process to consider it. 
um, incredibly disappointing response from the council. And I'd like the panel to be clear on the following. Foodstuffs made its submission in accordance with clause six of the RMA within the template provided by the Selma District Council, and it has followed and responded appropriately to all procedural requirements. The full suite of evidence provided by Foodstuffs three weeks ago in support of its submission is entirely consistent with the standard process and the directions of the panel and the website instructions of providing written evidence to support the submission, which indicated actually a lesser period of 10 working days. I'm involved in these processes up and down the country. This is an unusual, this is standard process. We are providing evidence in the first instance, not rebuttal evidence, in accordance with a panel minute which specifically requests that for submissions seeking to rezone land, it is the responsibility of the submitters to provide all necessary technical evidence to support any rezoning. We anticipate that the technical information required to support their rezoning submissions will need to be extensive and include ex expert assessments on a range of matters. That minute was released after the submissions had been lodged in accordance with standard procedure. While the panel may find it of assistance to have further comment from the council, I submit that due to the circumstances we find ourselves in, the panel is fully entitled to rely on the evidence presented to it in accordance with its directions, and foodstuffs evidence is the only evidence before you on the site rezoning. That other, that other submitters may have more detailed submissions as a product of their circumstances. For example, the panel, as you're aware, on the proposed Salmon District Plan, specifically requested evidence to be provided by submitters before the officer's report. It is not something that has been required in Variation 1, and it would not normally be expected, and first stuff should not be criticised for that. If you don't have any questions on that, I'll move on to Policy 3D. Thank you. So turning now to policy 3D. Um, so you're aware, obviously, that this variation process provides for um, medium density residential activity. And it's also the panel must give effect to policy 3D. Now, the idea, if we stand back and look at that, makes a lot of sense, right? Because we're enabling through medium density a huge amount of residential growth, theoretically or practically, depending on the circumstances. And what that also requires the council to do is have a look at policy um, 3D and have a look at its zones, its centre zones, its commercial activities, and making sure that there's also enough commercial activity. And if we look at what the sale and district plan has done, the variation one has done here, it, it's done, you know, just taking other areas, for example, in Prebleton, it's up zoned its local centre zone to a town centre zone. You've referred to uh, the ag research site, sir, in the Lincoln area, we're aware of residential land that was up has been recommended for approval to up zone to town centre zone. Um, we, in Rolleston here, we've got some new neighbourhood centre zones, we've got some additional bits added here and there. The Policy 3D enables the council to consider this, and it enables the council through section 77N to create new zones or to look at those existing zones as part of that. So when we look at policy 3D, we've got words, and, and the reason I'm raising this is because we are a little bit different, as you'll probably know, is that we're not seeking a town centre zone, a neighbourhood centre zone, or a um, local centre zone with the same provisions as what's already in the plan. We're seeking something a little bit different. And so when you look at the words of 3D and we look at whether we're talking about creating a new zone, it talks about something that's equivalent to a neighbourhood centre zone, a local centre zone and a town centre zone. So the words equivalent in my submission enable considerations of zones that are not just those zones. Um, and when you look at the MPS on urban development, it directs you to the national planning standard for the meaning of those zones. So when you look at your town centre zones in your large areas, and as I've been described, include the sort of broader range of commercial, community, recreational and res residential activities. And then when you look at your local centre zones, they're predominantly for commercial and community activities that service the residential catchment. So what an effect, I mean, I think you can call the zone whatever you like, but when you look at what an effect's been sought for this site, is a zone that enables um, two of those activities, which in my submission are clearly commercial activities and also community activities by definition. Um, so it, it is equivalent to in terms of 3D and to read it in any other way would be a stretch, I think, of those provisions. So 
by, um, and I just want to refer to you because it does provide some confusion. So if you look at policy three and it talks about um, densities commensurate with the level of commercial activity and community services, you're, you're probably, I've probably taken to you this before, but community services is defined in the policy statement to include commercial activities that service the needs of the community. So when interpreting this, um, it's clear that the activities proposed for the site um, and the, you know, the rules that have been changed has been to restrict to those activities, so you can't enable another town centre zone. COVID, COVID has taught us that supermarkets are an essential service um, and the Pack and Save consent provides for public walkways, open spaces, it's to be used like a park, there's seating and there's a biodiversity strip. And what I have done, I know it's outside this process, but just so you can visualise, um, I've put up some of the imagery from the Pack and Save there in terms of what's um, going to occur on that site for the Pack and Save. Uh, Mr Smith, who is a trade retailer, and Miss Parrish are clear in the evidence that they see intended activities, um, they see their intended activities servicing and providing employment for the residential catchments in the local community. Um, and, you know, a minor 10 retail activity contains things like a cafe, garden centre and playground. So they, these are all focused, um, fall squarely within that term there of uh, commercial activities which serve the needs of the community. So the proposed rezoning site at 157 Levi Road is, an, is within an area of significant residential growth um, and will be servicing that, that community catchment. And so I say it's clear that it gives effect to um, policy 3D to recognise that activity on that site. Um, and if you're going to, to nitpick and say, well, we're only rezoning existing activities and not new activities, I think that you can apply that reasoning to the pack and save um, on the site. And then when you consider the words of the policy 3D talking about whether you need to consider adjacent areas as well, that would then allow the expansion into the entire site. So I did actually listen with interest yesterday to Mr. Cleary. He, he had raised some legal submissions. Um, he had, he had he had brought some legal submissions around scope and he had commented on post staff, although he didn't say anything um, to the panel yesterday and you didn't ask any questions of that. But Mr Cleary provided submissions with respect to his land that he was representing at that time under the airport contours and he talked about, with reference to uh, Ms Dewar's submissions, that the enabling that the amendment act actually enables additionally re, additional re, re, additional land to be rezoned. Um, it's not discreet. It applies to Rolleston, Prebleton, Lincoln. I agree. And he talked specifically about that site under Plan Change seventy one that had been notified in a specific appendix of Part B, um, and that the contour land would therefore logically be connected, um, and it would be served to say it's out of uh, left field. And the irony on those submissions is. Um, this land has been picked up as part of Plan Change 71. Foodstuffs didn't have a supermarket on it, but we were part of the Plan Change 71 process. So it was notified. 157 Levi Road was also notified with the adjoining piece of land subject to an ODP to provide connections into that site. Now those connections, the key connection obviously being the Broadfield Link Drive has been put onto the ODP that we propose. Uh, but the arguments made by Mr Cleary there uh, can equally apply to what we are here. This is a live matter for consideration. It has been zoned with a new ODP subject to medium density residential that does not reflect the current activity. So in my submission, I think you can call our zone what you like. The reality is it is equivalent to what is intended to be provided um, between the town centre and neighbourhood centre. It's a bespoke zoning, and the reason it's bespoke is to ensure that it doesn't uh, conflict with any other policies, which puts that out of um, you know, the hierarchy of the centres um, in terms of the town centre, neighbourhood centre, local centre. And you may even recall, when I'm talking about another process here, but it has formed part of the proposed Salmon District Plan, when Mr Derek Foy appeared in response to the concerns raised by foodstuffs, uh, that there is just simply no place to put these supermarkets. And he, it was his suggestion to use the large format retail zone as a bespoke zone that could be used around the district and tailored for these particular activities, activities that aren't suited to a main street environment, but are permitted within the town centre zone, which is both the trade retailer and the supermarket activity in this instance, uh, that have operational and functional needs for large sites. 
there is no room in the zone for the, these activities um, and which are near and close to the centre. We're within the urban boundaries with, you know, it was found by the um, commissioner and agreed by the experts through the pack and save that it was a compact urban form. Um, it's an ideal site and I would suggest that the Salwyn District Council is lucky to have it available for commercial in terms of the submissions I've heard about just simply lack of commercial land. Uh, so that's where I'm sitting on policy 3D and I'll just keep rolling and you'll ask questions at the end, Commissioner. Um, so now turning to Mr Clary, Mr Clary made some um, basic submissions about the site being outside zone. Um, and, I, and you may be aware of it because you've read uh, my legal submissions as well, but just the points that I'd make is Mr Clary has referred to the wrong section of the Act um, and he hasn't started with Clause 33, uh, which is the transitional provisions which apply. I've attached them to my legal submissions, but they're actually um, a bit more broad for processes like this one where you're already halfway through the process when you're notifying your variation. So it's very clear there that you um, have to ensure that you can carry out your functions under Section 77N, which obviously refers to new urban zones and new urban non-residential and up to um, Policy 3D, and then it may include any other provisions that is proposed to be included in non-residential urban zones where that, where that zone is giving effect to the intensification policies um, and any consequential changes. So there's quite broad relief there, and I don't think his reference to... Um, his sections, what did he say, of 80E and 80G, <coughs> 77G and B, I disagree with this approach and a result of his interpretation. The starting point is clause 33 and it applies specifically to this variation. Mr. Clare has also stated that he doesn't think section 77N applies. Um, and it, the crux of his argument, as I understand it, is he doesn't think if it's residential, it could be rezoned to non-residential. It's only for the land that's not residential. I mean, the, the whole thing's odd, but when you look at the section in 77F, the interpretation of what an urban non-residential zone is defined as, which Mr Kerry doesn't refer to, it means any zone in an urban environment, which Rolleston clearly is, um, that is not a residential zone. So all it's trying to tell you there is you're creating a, a, a zone that's not your residential zones, not that you have to not zone residential zone land. The whole thing's a bit weird. Um, and finally, the, oh, I'm talking about on the plan change. Um, I mean, you're obviously aware that you can make submissions. And I, I just simply make a comment. I know that you've heard a lot about scope, but Mr. Cleary's focus on, most of his legal submissions on the orthodox approach to scope as set out in Clearwater. Um, and I agree that that's applicable um, to variation one as it's incorporated by that clause 91, oh, 95 schedule one. Um, but I do say that this approach to scope needs to be read against the specific provisions for variations, um, which incorporate the MDRS and the policies three and five. And there is case law for this approach. So in Auckland and Albany, North landowners and Auckland Council, the High Court found that traditional case law was unhelpful for scope issues arising from bespoke legisl legislation created for that Auckland super city. Um, the scope was increased because the proposed Auckland unit due plan covered essentially all resource management issues. Um, I think we just need to be cautious about taking such a strict approach there uh, because this is a one step approach. You have to judicial review, you don't get a consideration on the merits. So in my view, I do think you need to look at um, whether something's on a variation and I've made submissions in that respect, but you've also need to look at variation one as extending to include those non-residential urban rezonings that give effect to policies three or five. And once a submission's made, um, you're obviously well aware that you can also make a re recommendation both within and outside scope of those submissions made through Clause 99. So that's sort of the key points um, that I wanted to make. The only other one <clears throat> I think I made in my legal submissions is that when we're looking about an opportunity for parties to participate outside this process, I've talked about the... Uh, the pack and save rezoning. Um, Mr. Cleary's clients gave written approval to that. On we discussed and agreed that interface uh, between the boundary of our site and Plan Change Seventy One. So written approval was provided to that, and that that the reason for these changes to this large format retail zone is to ensure 
that the the pack and save and the I guess the provisions that were put to really create that opportunity for the residential interface follow through to the zone. Um, and you'll be aware that what hasn't occurred um, through this variation one is that interface with commercial activities and residential activities. The way existing residential zones have been zoned is they've been zoned medium density residential right up to the boundary of existing commercial activities. And that obviously has a lot of implications when you, uh, I guess, if you're feasibly thinking about a three story high building um, overlooking a, a yard of a supermarket that might be operating 24 seven, when previously you could put a fence up and some landscaping and no one would see that, that, that sort of falls away. I think what the commissioners um, and the council can be really confident of here is this is a genuine interface between a residential zone and a commercial zone. One which we would have seen if you've read the full submission of foodstuffs is something that's particularly important. And I think has been lost through some of these variation processes, advancing just the medium density residential along existing zones. And there's rules around qualifying matters, so you can't set activities back and it's not anticipated, but there is a, there's a massive change of amenity between those interfaces. <clears throat> So yes, you could put a large format retail zone or a town centre zone without any of these extra nicety change to the provisions, but it's incredibly important from foodstuffs perspective and for certainty of activities going forward and the longevity of those business um, and community relationships that those um, provisions are provided and the experts are obviously hugely in support of that. And that is all I really wanted to add in addition to my legal submissions. I can whip these notes into a form to provide to you. Thank you for that. You might have anticipated we obviously have some concerns about scope and I'll just run through those concerns now, give you another opportunity to address them. Yeah. Now, the first thing is that the um, food stuff submission didn't specify a large format retail zone because it didn't specify what particular zone was required. Um, you're now seeking a large format retail zone over that site. You're also seeking bespoke provisions in the CMUZ and large format retail zone chapters. Neither of those chapters were part of Variation 1. The status quo in those chapters hasn't been altered by Variation 1. And the hearing on the CMUZ and large format retail zones has already occurred. Uh, where that hearing panel considered amendments to the provisions of those chapters, you're now seeking further amendments to those chapters or to the commercial <laughs> CMUZ and large format retail zone chapters. Um, obviously, the land has been zoned MRZ, it was GRUZ before that, um, before variation zoned at MRZ. So arguably the issue for us is should the status quo remain GRUZ or should it be zoned MRZ? You're also now seeking a zoning that obviously other parties haven't had an opportunity to submit on or be aware of. And I note that for your pack and save consenting process, there were 27 submissions in opposition. So I don't think anyone could fairly say that in this case, had a large format retail zone been sought from the outset, that there might not have been interested parties who might have wished to have their say on that. And then of course we come to potentially an avenue for you, which you've already discussed, section 77N3A, enabling the council to create new urban and new urban non-residential zones, but of course that's subject to 77 N31, which in turn refers to policy three, as you've mentioned, the only part of policy three that's relevant to Selwyn is policy 3D, because they're the only zones within Selwyn that are referred to in that policy. Policy 3D starts with the words within and adjacent to neighborhood centre zones, local centre zones, and town centre zones. This site that you have in front of us is not adjacent to those zones, it's adjacent to a medium density zone to the MRZ, it's not adjacent to a town centre zone or a local centre zone or a neighbourhood centre zone. It's directly adjacent to the general rural zone and the MRZ zone. So there's a whole bunch of scope issues that we're concerned about, both in terms of 
the ability under the statute for us to consider the request and also in terms of procedural fairness, other parties who might have had an interest in what you're now seeking, uh, both in terms of the zoning for the site and now the bespoke provisions you're seeking to chapters of the plan that weren't even part of variation one. Do we answer, please? If you can. Yeah, I think I can. Um, so in terms of not specifying large format retail zone, the proposed sale and district plan has been in a state of flux, isn't it? So everything's been changing and the large format retail zone at the time it was notified had supermarket activities as non-complying, was it? Yeah, so through the proposed sale and district plan, we're now aware of our plan of being involved in conferencing, which now makes that permitted. So it becomes a zone that's um, applicable to that site. Uh, whereas previously on notification, it wouldn't have been. So for us to specify a zone just, and- Just step back, just repeat what you said then. Oh, so- Go through that again. Oh, so- You talk really fast, so. Oh, sorry, Commissioner. So if we go back to the proposed Salmon District Plan, yeah, and this is why I set out the background to where we're heading on this, because this is a variation to the proposed Salmon District Plan, right? So the variation- To give effect to the MDRS. Yeah, to give effect to the MDRS and to give effect to policy three, which includes 3D. Well, and only 3D in the case of Salmon. Yeah, so that's fine. I'm okay with that. I'm comfortable. So if we were to... We have to be consistent with the zones that have been put through the proposed Salmon District Plan. It's, it's not unusual at all that we didn't specify a zone because at that time, we had made a submission, the notification of the proposed Salmon District Plan, which created... No zone, there was no space for any supermarkets anywhere. The town centre zone had a permitted activity, but had a whole pile of rules that we say don't work for a supermarket. The large format retail zone upon notification had a non-complying activity status for a supermarket. To specify a zone at that time, we, we couldn't have. And, and that is why the words are very clear about, and I read them out at the start. Um, you know, first I sought, uh, that we and had these intentions. We wanted to change the site to a commercial zoning. Um, you're able to create a new non-urban zone. We seek the removal of the site from the MDRS and we sought a zone that would be an appropriate commercial zone to reflect those intended and future activities. I don't think we could be in a position to tell you what that zone is. This is a very different process to what is, in a normal instance, established rules. And it might be easy if I jump down to one of your other questions in terms of you know, your options are the status quo. So do you rezone medium density or do you go back to a general residential zone? And that, that is the case, except for it's very clear that you're also able to do consequential changes because do you know what? The general residential zone doesn't exist after this process. So you've got the position where you have to seek to either rezone medium density residential or you go back to the status quo. Well, in this circumstance, that status quo doesn't exist anymore. So the consequential relief is that you need to look for another zone that's appropriate for that activity. And that is in my submission why the Act has been drafted so broad in terms of the powers, because they've contemplated that this is going to occur, like it has in this situation. And this process has been incredibly long and, and things change. We are planning for a document that's going to be 10, possibly 30 years. I say that with bated breath because I know that there's some reforms in the background. But, you know, um, and, and you need to be thinking ahead. And the reason they've got that specific Clause 33, sir, which I'm sure you've read, which is the transitional provisions, that applies specifically to the Salwyn situation. When you look at Clause 33, which I know that Mr Carey hasn't referred to, um, you know, this is for situations where a specified territory authority, which is Salwyn as a tier, tier one, um, has already notified its district plan. And it's now got these coming in on it. So it says, look, you're not required to notify a new plan change. You can do a variation, but you've got to give effect to MDRS and give effect to policy three. And you've got to ensure that you can carry out your functions under section 70N, which is this creation of new zones. And you can include any other provisions that is proposed to be included in non-residential urban zones where that zone is giving effect and any other changes consequential on or necessary to. But in, in my view, this is entirely the situation. Otherwise, it would put commissioners like yourself in difficult situations where the merits of an application such as this one are strong and you're, you're bound by case law which is unnecessary. 
this is this clause that has the most relevance to your decision. It applies specifically to the Southern District Plan and it provides a lot more flexibility than it would if you were following the normal process. So that would answer your first question, sir. Um, in terms of, oh, and that would also answer one of your other questions about, well, you know, status change from medium density back to residential. Well, you can't go back to a zone that doesn't exist and that's why there's that consequential relief and the ability to create new zones. And what no one talks about, and actually it's pretty easy to be lost, and I don't criticise anyone for not being able to read this particular piece of legislation, but under Section 70F, it talks very clearly and it defines what an urban non-residential zone is. And it means any zone in an urban environment that is not a residential zone. Any zone at all, call it what you want. It's a zone that's not for medium density residential or with those qualifying matters. There's so much scope there, I don't think you have any concerns for scope in respect of that transitional provision. Now, when you talk about zoning, site-specific zoning, and in particular this chapter not being subject to the rules, I think that's a very good point. And I think it could easily be um, catered for by pulling it out as a, a new urban zone, which is a bespoke zoning for the site. So it has the same provisions, um, but it, it applies to the site as the planners have drafted. And I can get them to address you on that matter in particular. But there's no one affected by that. The provisions we're creating aren't changing anyone else's ability to do activities on their land. It's only changing the site in a way that's been completely consistent with the majority of the site that's already been changed through a public process. I actually went back, sir, just talking about, I think you referred to 26 submissions. I went back and had a look at those submissions and the locations, and I've got a map here if you're interested. Those submissions are dotted across the town. They, were very, they weren't focused to the site itself. In fact, I was very surprised at how little people were interested in that. The direct submissions in opposition came from the neighbours on Levi Road, um, which is directly opposite the Pack and Save, and that ship sailed. The Pack and Save is going to be constructed, as Miss Parrish has said. And, and then the developer across the side, uh, across the main, the main submitter on the other periphery of the side was the devel a developer who has now, um, as Mr. Metherill has referred to in his evidence, uh, changed and, and you know, he's cut that site down, he's subdivided, and they had a planner, they were part of a process, they're well aware of this process and they, didn't, they chose not to be involved. The other landowner, which goes around the whole site, is Mr. Jared Cleary's clients, they provided written approval for this, um, the interface that we now propose in the zone. And in addition to that, um, the, I was going to say that they, they have, so that is the client there, the developer. In addition to that, they made a submission on this seeking that we have that appropriate interface and these provisions directly respond to their submission. So any suggestion that they can't be involved in this process, I have little risk, I don't think it should have any weight. Mr. Cleary was here yesterday and he was able to, as we are all able to, make comments on other people's evidence before you, the panel, and he chose not to. And I'd suggest that he chose not to because they had agreed with that interface, which we now have implemented across the entire boundary to their site. So that would be um, people there. Now, talking to the comment about policy 3D. And I think that's a good one. And that's why I addressed you on it specifically. Because if you read policy 3D in isolation and you don't consider section 77N, yeah, you could say that the council's only able to look at land within its existing zones and adjacent to it. And I think that if you read it like that, that would have fundamental problems for a number of zones that the council sought to be rezoned in these new residential areas to neighbourhood centre, I see there's been recommendations from the officer's report, there's been some transfer. It's not intended to be, be read that way. If you're going to create a new, because when you look at the words of section 77N, may create new non-urban residential zones or amend existing urban non-residential zones. And new non-urban residential zones as defined are any zone in an urban environment that is not a residential zone. You can't read that policy in terms of the provisions of what's being proposed is that you only are able to um, create your new urban zone adjacent to. Giving effect to policy 3D means you're considering your density provided across Rolleston in this instance, and you're working out where it's appropriate to create that um, commercial activity that's commensurate with that demand. And that's occurred in the officers of court when they have rezoned in Farrington, for example, that rural land up to um, neighbourhood centre. 
and that was notified as part of the plan change. There's been recommendations by the officer's report to include, I saw one yesterday, to include a neighbourhood centre zone in a residential um, development and, and ODP. If you, if you were to take such a strict reasoning, none of that could also apply. It makes no sense in terms of what is sought to be achieved by policy 3D. And then when you further on, I think, you know, the other one I thought was, oh, well, is it meant to do this? Because it talks about that you have to have both um, commercial activities and community activities. But then when you look at the definition of community activities in the front of the NPS, and I've taken you through that. Community, ser oh, community services, sorry. Community services means the following. Commercial activities that serve the needs of the community. I mean, I think it's, pretty clear from the evidence of Mr Smith and Ms Parrish that what they're seeking to do on that site um, is create, to serve the needs of the community. It's a residential catchment focused activity akin to or equivalent to how you would in the town centre zone or the local centre zone. And what strengthens my point in that respect, um, sir, is that the town centre zone explicitly permits these two activities. But I think, you know, we are, I think... What did you say then? The, the, which zone? The town centre zone. Permits? Permits trade retail activities and supermarkets. It's equivalent to, it's akin to. We're not trying to create something different. The reason we've got to a zoning, and, and um, I can have the plan to speak to this, the way we have, is because we're also mindful while implementing policy 3D that we don't need to, up, we can't upset the balance of the, the retail hierarchy. You know, in terms of if you were to put a town centre zone there, you're creating activities beyond what is contemplated through this bespoke zoning, which may have impact on the town centre zone. And, and I think the um, point that I think we need to look at and, and we could provide further reply on is, you know, what we can do to get around the issue that you have that the large format retail zone wasn't notified as part of variation one is to create a new urban zone which applies to this site. Because that's in effect, when you look at what has been changed in those provisions, that's in effect what it's been doing. It's, it's saying, look, the large format retail zone, while appropriate to these activities, and the size of the site so restrictive and that you're not going to get more than two activities on here, it doesn't properly provide for that interface with residential. The reason, um, I guess I was surprised too that the council didn't offer in their office to report what commercial zone they thought would be appropriate. And that's what we've come up with, you know, looking at where the proposed Salmon District plan process has been heading and our involvement in that. And where, you know, this is going. So we're trying to create something that doesn't upset any of those processes while still meets the, um, the policy 3D intention. You said that you understood through the earlier hearings that, correct me if I'm wrong, that supermarkets have now permitted within the large format retail zone, or that that's been the recommendation. Is that what you said, or that's, did I mishear that? Yeah, no, so I will defer to Mark, Mark to expert conferencing on that, where they all agreed that it needs to be permitted. So markets need to be permitted in the large format retail zone. And I understand the reporting officer then recommended that with the support of Mr Derek Foy, who suggested a way to also create more supermarkets was to have the zoning around the community. So what rule was that? Yeah. Yeah. I can so there, was a, there was a joint witness statement prepared with three plans involved in that. I wasn't part of that hearing, so I'm just oh, curious. Gotcha. It's, a, it's actually an, a link to in my legal submissions. Oh, so Lindsay, you were in that part. So you, you can understand why the submission required to had to say equivalent commercial zone or a, an appropriate commercial zone. You're just not in a position when you're in the movement of these processes to be able to with certainty say anything about what zone you want on that site. Um, and I don't think that's unusual. I'm involved in other processes where that's considered acceptable, but the council has taken a broader mind and actually looked across all its zones and has changed zones and added extra new urban zones um, for other processes I've been involved in. What we're doing with here is Salwyn has left it to us to make submissions on what would be appropriate. And that's what we've done.
in particular right now, I'm looking at um, the Tauranga intensification provisions, Plan Change 33. And obviously they've got economic evidence to support. The economists have gone through, they've considered all of the existing centres, they've considered new areas, they've made changes and they've notified that. That didn't occur in Selwyn. Selwyn simply notified with a couple of changes and has left it to submissions to make that point. I don't think we can be penalised by doing what may have been picked up by a planner in the first instance and notified by the council. It makes, so the, the other challenge to this, as you know, being involved is if this isn't rezoned, you've got a situation where you've got a large format supermarket in a residential zone that has now significantly shifted from the operative plan provisions to a proposed plan which does not contemplate non-residential activities of that scale at all in the zone as a non-complying activity. All right, and I guess the last issue that we'd like to ask you about, or certainly I would, since um, you already have a resource consent for the supermarket proposal, which I, I don't, I'm not familiar with the detail of that, but I suspect that doesn't have a fixed term. It doesn't expire. No, no. So it's, the supermarket activity is fully consented and provided for. So why do you need a rezoning anyway if there are scope issues? So you've got to look at the most efficient and effective provisions for an activity on the site. And Mr. Allen deals with this. If you were to do any amendments and variations, which as you know, are very commonplace when you're um, you know, building supermarkets. We're building one in town at Papua Nui at the moment. And I'm gonna suggest there has been four variations, three, three and a fourth one coming. You're considering that variation against residential provisions which do not anticipate, contemplate, or provide for any of that situation. It's a very inefficient way, and I would not say that it meets the purpose of the Act. And it has quite standard planning practice to, after activities has been consented, to rezone them to an appropriate zone, which the officer's report does across Rolleston for other areas including neighbourhood centres within residential areas that are currently zoned rural. If, if the um, council was to consider that another zone would be appropriate, we'd be happy to obviously have those discussions and we tried to commence those discussions and had no joy in that space. What, um, what you need to remember is we're not the council. No, I know that. We're an independent hearings panel. So. Correct. But what I, I don't see there's any issue for creating a new urban zone that's bespoke to the site that would be appropriate in the circumstances as a result of where we've got to through this process. So I don't believe the scope issues you've raised um, can't be managed. All right. So I'll just see if anyone else has any questions for you arising from the legal submissions, Raymond. Anything? Is there anything you want to add to that? Oh, All right. Well, we've raised our scope concerns. You've addressed them. So thank you for that. Um, we're not going to say we're not going to hear the rest of your case. Obviously, we will do, and we will have questions for a number of your experts. Um, just reiterate that we have read the evidence, so they don't need to read it out loud. But as in other hearings, they're welcome to summarise key points. Before we move to questions or else they can move straight to questions but we'll leave that up to each witness sounds good thank you and what we will do is just start with the experts online um yeah so perhaps mr milne are you there oh, we'll go with fraser mr colgrave are you there yes i am oh gosh sorry that's very bright on scary that yes Morning. Yeah, good morning, Mr. Colgrave. Morning. Um, I'll, I'll take your guidance, sir, that you've, you've read it all, so I'm not going to, obviously not going to read through. Just got a couple of key points I guess I'd like to summarise um, in respect to this proposal. Um, the first one, I guess, which we all know is that, you know, Salmon is an extremely fast-growing area, um, fastest-growing in New Zealand. Obviously, with that growth comes a very strong demand for hardware, garden, building supplies, activities. Um, but despite that backdrop, the district has a really anomalously low um, level of hardware and retail supply. So it's 10 times lower than the national average relative to building consent activity, and it's five times lower than the national average relative to the current size of the population. So on the one hand, you've got this district that's incredibly fast growing, and on the other hand, 
you've got almost no hardware um, and garden and building retail to supply it. So there's obviously a really clear need for something like um, a MITRE 10 or a trade retail like that to establish. Um, and um, e e there's a need for this, but there's also um, very little opportunity for it to go anywhere. So the town centre is too small. Or the, there's no um, available sites in town centre that are large enough. The large format retail zone on Jones Road um, isn't really on the right side of the tracks in terms of where the population is and building activity. Um, and similarly with the general industrial zone. Um, on the other hand, the subject site um, meets uh, typical sort of site and location criteria, not only from Mitre 10's perspective, because that's where they're, they're sort of keen to go, but also you know, my independent analysis has also shown that that's the best place for it to go because it's highly visible, highly accessible, large, flat, free of contamination. It basically ticks all the boxes. So. I guess from an economics perspective, um, the idea of allowing trade retail to occur right here amongst where the building activity and the population is um, makes really good sense. Um, and in terms of the adverse effects, it's not going to have an adverse effect on the town centre because there's no hardware retailers to compete with. And also, if the site was unavailable, it wouldn't otherwise go there. So you're not, you're not sort of taking trade away from the town centre and you're not depriving it of a, a tenant that would otherwise go there. Um, and while there will be a small effect on residential land supply, um, it's quite small in the wider scheme of things. And at the margin on balance, I consider a trade retail user to be a much better use of the site, given the incredible shortage of it currently. So from an economics perspective, um, it ticks all the boxes and it's um, strongly supported on those grounds, sir. Thank you. I'll see if we have questions, Raymond. Yeah, I am. Um, good morning, Mr. Colgrave. I good morning. was going to talk to you about your paragraph 61 where you talk about hardware, no hardware stores, low percentage of hardware hardware stores in Rolleston. Um, and I was going to ask you, ask you why that was, but you've explained that. So I'm going to go back to your paragraph 29 and ask you what sales cannibalism means. Oh, <laughs> I'm sorry I'm about these. Um, yeah, sorry. But what it really means is if you've got a, a bunch of stores of the same network, let's just use McDonald's for simplicity. If you build um, a, a new McDonald's store too close to an existing one, it's going to steal trade from that existing store. So, so rather than attracting new trade, you're, you're really stealing trade from another store. So when you have a network of stores, um, you try and space them out so that they all act um, as a network, but they don't sort of cross over each other's catchments and steal their trade. So just on that, there's a countdown supermarket, um, you know, not far from the where the pack and save will go. Would that would that produce that problem? Um, so the, the the pack and save isn't really the focus of my evidence, but I did I, I was part of the resource consent process for the pack and save, and we, I went through a extensive exercise of uh, looking at the, the trade impacts of the proposed pack and save. And yes, it will divert trade from the countdown store, but but countdown and pack and save aren't operated by the same uh, banner brand. So, so one's foodstuffs and one's Woolworths New Zealand. So, so there is trade competition between those stores, but it's not cannibalization in the sense that you're not stealing trade from your own network. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Lindsay. Uh, no, thank you. I've just got a um, couple of questions for you. First one's at your paragraph 36. Yes. And you talk there about this, um, the existing large format retail zone not being suitable for a number of reasons. One of them being that your understanding is that the owners of that site are looking to have a Bunnings move in there. Have you discussed that with Carter Group and confirmed whether that's factual or not? Uh, no, I haven't discussed it with them, but my understanding, um, I have worked with the Carter Group on other plan changes and other proposals in Greater Christchurch. My understanding is that that was a sort of an indicative uh, a banner, if you like, sort of a, what they would like to have there, but it's not a firm commitment uh, of the resource consent that, that that banner will go there. So am I frozen?
Fraser. I'm not too sure what it's Tony here. I'm not too sure what happened there. But, <laughs> it just it came up on the screen saying I'm the host now. Yeah, I saw that. Oh yeah. God. Um I yeah, okay. I'm not Yeah. I'm not too sure if they can hear us or not. <laughs> no, it, it looks it looks like they've dropped out of there. And were you yeah. able to hear me before? Or? Yes, I yeah, yeah I could yeah. hear you fine. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, hopefully they kick back up. I'll text Alex and let her know that it's broken it out. In. Yeah, yeah. I suppose we could always leave and rejoin if that needs yeah. to be. Yeah. All right. I'll just text I know. Them. Here we go. They're coming back. Oh, yeah. they're back. Excellent. Okay. Oh, oh. There, there we go. I'll, oh. go on, I'll go on mute and you can. Yeah, sorry, we lost you there momentarily. So just oh, that, that, that's okay. It, it, it declared that I was the host now, and I felt omnipotent there shortly. But anyway, we're back online. Um, yeah, so um, my understanding is the Bunnings was um, was earmarked or as the sort of thing they were trying to attract, but not that it hasn't been locked in as such. Okay. So is that you're not? So there's no certainty that a Bunnings is going to move into that large format retail zone? That's my understanding, sir. Um, but I uh, I am aware um, of a hoarding recently or signposts recently in the district saying that a placemaker is likely to appear in that area soon. Right. But it's a placemaker that's uh, very much focused on um, just the trade customers. Um, and I think that the, the advertising for it says that it's been uh, put there with their trade customers in mind, which really, I guess, reinforces the point I'm trying to make is that that sort of land north of the state highway is very much an industrial um, business focused area. So it's the sort of place where you'd expect um, an activity that's very much focusing on trade customers where um, south of the uh, state highway where the town centre and all the residential is, is where you expect activities that are focused on, on the residential customers primarily. And that's the, that's the focus of the store, sir. Thanks. And just looking at your 38, paragraph 38, you say the, large, the existing large format retail zone um, across Jones Road. And what I'm taking from your evidence there is you think it's too far away from the residential areas. I'm just wondering, is it actually the case? Certainly in the town where I live and in the North Island, it's a 10 or 15 minute drive to the Mega Mitre 10 and people do that very happily. Yeah, they, they do. People, it, sorry. And people drive from Napier to Hastings to go to a Bunnings if they like that better. So... Is that really an impediment at being across Jones Road? I wouldn't say it's too far, but it's not the it's not the optimal location. So if you if you could have a store in and amongst the existing residential area and where all the building activity is going to occur, that's going to be better than having it across a state highway carrying you know, several thousand um, vehicles a day, plus the the railway lines and things like that. So I guess. In some ways, it's it's a perceptual barrier. Um, I'm not saying that having it there would be um, completely off the table, but it certainly wouldn't be anywhere as good from a location perspective in terms of being visible and accessible and those kinds of things. And that visibility and accessibility is really important for retail. Yeah. And again, just a similar question, just um, because your evidence is focused in part on alternative locations. Um, your paragraph 47, you're talking about the PC80 area. Yes. Um, primarily designed for industrial businesses that want a rail siding. Um, and I guess the implication there is not suited to a Mitre 10. Again, have you discussed with the Carter group or the proponents of that industrial zoning whether or not a Mitre 10 would be appropriate in that area from their perspective? I haven't had that conversation. It's been more um, talking with the Mitre 10 team about whether it would suit them from, from their perspective, sir. Right. Okay. No, that's fair enough. Right. No further questions. Thank you, Mr. Colgrave. Thanks, sir. Mr. Milne dealing with landscape, correct? Yes, yes, I am. Yeah, good morning. Welcome, Mr. Milne. I'm um, not sure if you've been listening to date, but we've read the evidence. Thank you for that. You're welcome to highlight key points if you'd like to, or else we can go straight to questions. Up to you. For sure. Thank you, sir. And good morning. Good morning, commissioners. I'm currently in a portacom in the back streets of Cromwell, so try not to be there uh, this morning, but um, double booked with a, another hearing today as well. So um, if I can just, um, I suppose, 
reiterate or reinforce two or three key points in terms of landscape. Um, and also, if I can just back up slightly, um, a wee bit like uh, Miss Booker did in terms of involvement or previous involvement on the site. And I think that's quite important when it comes to understanding effects um, that a large format retail zone might have on the site. Um, I was heavily involved with the Pack and Save Resource Consent and that led from very early on, very early on as a team approach, locating that building on the site. Um, and then working, and very importantly, working very closely with um, District Council's consultant landscape architects to establish um, an appropriate uh, landscape outcome on the site that would um, manage effects uh, in, in time. And, and those, um, or, or that consultation through the resource consent process led to the consented uh, site design um, as well as the suite of landscape conditions. So for me, that was a starting point. Um, when one looks at the character of the site, uh, at the moment, one needs to consider that consented uh, baseline as well, which is resource consent 216016. Um, and when we consider a change of character, um, we need to consider the amenity or or the um the what the, you know the uh, potential effects on the surrounding environment um, and that's money to do with visual amenity from those looking um, out and across to the site and the way one manages that uh, is through um, obviously bulk and location um, and also how one treats the interfaces of of the site um, i think when having reviewed um uh, uh the large format uh, retail zone application um the ODP suitably uh, locates um, future Balkan location um, on the site. Um, I think the existing provisions in terms of heights and setbacks uh, are adequate. And then along with the ODP, the notes on that OT ODP that relate to um, landscape interfaces. Um, and those notes have been guided by the conditions of consent uh, for the pack and save, because I thought they were most appropriate. And in talking with uh, Mr. Compton Moen and also Ms. Collie and Mr. Allen, we decided um, it was appropriate to uh, include those on the ODP. And so the ODP not only is it showing location um, as well as transport and pedestrian links, um, it has some fairly specific uh, landscape requirements um, that are bespoke or, or site specific um, to this location. And I think if future development enabled by the large for, uh, format retail zone uh, is an undertaken uh, aligned with the ODP and those requirements, as well as the tweaks that have been made to the various um, provisions within the um, proposed district plan, then um, potential landscape and visual amenity effects um, will be um, appropriately and, and well or very well managed um, on the site. So I suppose in a nutshell, that was what I wanted to reiterate um, and happy to answer any questions. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mel. Raymond? No, thank you. Lindsay? Yeah, just a quick couple. Um, when you were looking at the pack and save proposal, the application and, and developing that, what was your landscape considerations for the remainder of the site at that time? What were you anticipating as being a potential outcome on the, the area that we're talking about today? Um, I, if I, if I recall rightly, um, in assessing the, the pack and save proposal, um, it was um, the balanced balanced land was was left as as open land uh, um, in terms of my assessment. Okay, so in ter terms of, of of landscape, if there was too large large format retail supermarket or and or trade retail on that site, you didn't have any consideration of. Of the two together at the time, in not at the time. In terms of what that, what that would mean from a landscape perspective, for sure. No, not not at the time. I did not. The only thing I did consider was a comparable uh, medium density um, zoning outcome across the entire site. Okay. Um, second question: You've been in, uh, involved in the preparation of the uh, outline development plan, which has been submitted with evidence. Um, presume that the principles from a landscape perspective that were considered at the time of the pack and save resource consent application have been modified to accommodate the proposal before us now but the same basic principles apply is that a fair comment yeah, the, the same basic 
basic principles apply because um, they relate to the interface. Um, so the road uh, and the internal boundary interface, but also the balance of landscape across the rest of the site. So there is a, um, um, using the term bespoke again, but a specific provision for you know X amount for trees across the car park spaces. Um, so that, that was considered across the, the um, Mitre 10 um, part of the site as well. Mm, okay, thank you. Thank you. Mr. Milne, just two matters um, from me, just at your paragraph 15, you say, and you've mentioned it again this morning, that the resource consent for the pack and save provides certainty and confidence of appropriate interface and integration with PC71. And you're obviously involved in that process of developing uh, those provisions within the consent. Did that involve much discussion with other parties, um, submitters, the council staff, other experts? Was there a lot of discussion that went into that? There, there was actually, um, uh, both with um, submitters and with council. Um, and we looked at two or three different outcomes along that interface um, uh, and you know, before arriving at the one um, that was consented. So that on so that discussion and negotiation process resulted in material changes to the to the landscaping proposal. Yeah, what what we were looking at uh, chiefly was um, the mix of species, um, the heights of fences, um, whether we included um, some mounding and the like uh, along there as well. Um, and so there was a it was very much I mean I I would have thought a very good iterative process to arrive at the outcome that we have. And just one further matter, and I may just not have um, remembered where it was in your evidence or what the outcome was, but we've driven past the site, or well, Commissioner mm -hmm. Dace and I have, because we've been domiciled in Lincoln, so we drive to Rolleston each day. And um, there's a, that great big huge hedge along the boundary at the moment. Is that to be retained? No, 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 it's not. Um, and um, But there is a condition of consent for the pack and save that, that hedge is retained in part for part of the um, time of the construction of the site. Um, that isn't um, a note on the ODP as it stands at the moment, but um, that is a current condition of consent for the um, pack and save. Okay. So just during construction? That's right. Yeah. Yes. Right, that's all I wanted to ask you about. Thanks, Mr. Mill. Many thanks. Thank you for your time. I just thought we'd do the last Zoom, if that's all right, Mr. Hay, while he's there. Thank you, Ms. Mill. Thank you. Hello, can everybody hear me okay? Yep, sorry, I didn't have my microphone on. Yes, we can hear you. Can you hear us? Yes, yes, I can. Uh, apologies if we get cut off. I'm in a place with very flaky internet connection. We, uh, we got booted off just before. So, no, that's right. Uh, um, that's fine. We can't see you, but we can hear you. That's the most important thing. So did you wish to summarise any key points or shall we go to questions? Up to you. Uh, I, th I think a very brief summary. So uh, what I've conducted is not a full resource consent style assessment. It's, uh, it, it's, uh, and it's because there's not a firm proposal to assess, but we have uh, conducted uh, an assessment uh, of uh, a, a likely and foreseeable uh, trade supply company operating on the site uh, in a, in a in a likely and appropriate location and, uh, and taking into account uh, the effects of mitigation from an extension of the boundary treatment that is applying to the consented foodstuffs on down south across the boundary site uh, and taking into account uh, the level of, of uh, particularly uh, goods vehicles transiting between the uh, a building and the site boundary uh, and the loading and unloading activities associated with that. And we've assumed that uh, there would be three-storey residential buildings on the other side of the boundary uh, constructed one metre from the, the boundary. So in, uh, in, in essence, uh, those calculations show that 
the, the daytime noise levels uh, proposed for uh, a residential zone can be complied with. Uh, and because uh, the MITRE 10 activity is not proposing to do any deliveries at night, uh, the nighttime noise levels would not be, uh, be triggered as a result. So that's, that's the, the very brief summary, uh, and I'm happy to take questions. Great, thank you for that. Raymond, any questions on noise? Yeah, Lindsay? Um, I guess, guess from your evidence, you, you're going from fairly indicative plans and locations and so forth, but in, in terms of the acoustic issues, uh, they fall down to hours of operation, boundary treatment, um, uh, limitations on when deliveries can actually occur as well. So a combination of those factors would lead you from the information that you've got to assess that the any acoustic effects can be well managed. So that, that's my understanding of, of your of your evidence. Yes, that's correct. That's a good sign. Okay. No, nothing more. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Hay, no further, uh, further questions or clarification from me, but thank you very much for dialing in this morning. Yes, no problem at all. Thank you very much. Thanks, Mr. Hay. So I'm just going to um, check with you, mate. Can you remember what time the, uh, our coffee's rolling? 10.30. Okay, that's good. All right, shall we have another witness? Yep. Yeah. Good morning. Uh, yeah, I'm Dave Compton Mars, I'm an urban designer and landscape architect. Yes, um, Mr. Compton Mars, we've seen you lots of times before. Thank you. It's nice, nice to be here again. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'll just, I've just got a brief summary of my uh, evidence. I'll just go through the key points that I just want to reiterate yep. um, before taking questions. Um, I consider the receiving environment to be urban um, and any change in character assessed against the future um, medium MRZ zoning in the consent and pack and save development as opposed to the existing rural residential character that you currently see on site. Um, I don't think it has any effect on urban compact urban form. Obviously, we're dealing within the constraints of Rolleston itself in terms of the urban growth boundary, um, and obviously it's already zoned uh, for urban development. Um, if I jump to paragraph 24 um, in my evidence, uh, the scale of the building footprints are not dissimilar to the nearby warehouse building, being only a five minute walk away. It's a proposed location physically separate but, separate, but within walkable distance of the main commercial centre is considered appropriate. Um, so I think it's a development of this nature it complements the town centre, but it's it's not something that you'd, you'd you'd have on your main street per se. It's uh, it it doesn't have the same qualities. We're not looking for that finer grain retail. Um, I think a good example is uh, the Papua Nui Mitre Ten, uh, which is close to Northlands uh, in Christchurch City. Um, so it builds on that town centre, but it's not right right in the middle of it. Um, yeah, but also equally, I don't think it's an industrial activity, um, just based on the its customer base. Um, and so Mr. Colgrave has, has touched on that. Uh, I'll just jump to 26 in terms of the character change from, from medium density to the large format retail. And just at the end of that paragraph, um, the change, i.e. bigger buildings and, and car parking, uh, the change in character is not viewed as adverse as is continuing with the commercial character created by the consent of pack and save development and can be mitigated by adopting the same mitigation, i.e. the landscaping, as reflected in the consent conditions placed on the pack and save development. So that's the landscaping and the combination of the, the setbacks proposed. Uh, I want to jump down to paragraph 30. Um, the, just halfway through, the proposed building footprint shown on ODP for the intended trade retail, trade supply activity, set back approximately 20 metres from the Rome boundary at its closest point. Given the level of landscape treatment proposed combined with the building setback and the intervening road corridor, I consider any magnitude of change to be low, moderate at most, and that's consistent with the evidence that Mr Milne has provided. 
uh, in terms of visual dominance and shading, shading issue, issues, uh, paragraph 33, uh, the proposed building setback of 10 metres from the, um, the boundary with medium density uh, will mitigate any potential effects from the change of the maximum height limit, limit from 11 metres to 15 metres. And then I go into a little bit of detail about you know, recession planes and the like. Um, probably the ninth sentence down, there's uh, any dwellings taller than M that should be four metres, um, not just M. Um, so this is through uh, tracking, tracking uh, changes. Um, Sorry, can you switch paragraph was that again? Uh, paragraph 33. So it was in a, one of my original versions, but with tracking changes that are uh, accidentally got deleted. Right. So it should say four meters. And that's just where the uh, recession plan starts. Uh, paragraph 34, any potential effects are further mitigated by the proposed 10 meter wide biodiversity planting strip. So that's adopting exactly what's been proposed on the pack and save, pack and save site. Um, I've reviewed the landscape and building setback mitigation measures provided by Mr. Milne and agreed these measures are suitable to address any adverse uh, effects on neighbouring residential properties to the north. Um, I've also reviewed the planning provisions that Ms. Collies presented um, and also looked at the, the signage chapter as well, just to double check in terms of if there's any issues that would arise from the rezoning. Um, I consider that the uh, evidence, her evidence and those provisions uh, including supermarkets and trade retail on the site will be compatible with the medium density zone from an amenity and urban, dis urban character perspective. Uh, I don't see any issues in terms of connectivity and accessibility. Uh, the site's really well connected um, on a corner of uh, two busy roads that will, will get busier. Um, and just in conclusion, uh, I consider the proposed rezoning from large format retail to from, oh, sorry, to large format retail from medium density to be an appropriate change for a site on a busy intersection with no adverse effects on the area's anticipated receiving environment or Rolleston's wider urban form. Thank you. Raymond, any questions? Lindsay. Um, thank you, Mr. Compton, Mohan. Um, as the chair alluded, we've been past the site a few times and obviously had a look at the, the existing boundary treatment that there is at the moment, big hedging and so forth, so you can't actually physically see into the site. With the, the eventual removal of all of that, the, the site becomes very open as, as a result and would be replaced by the consent of pack and save, large building, high emphasis on the colour yellow, and potentially with um, uh, a, a building uh, sim similarly large with potentially a high emphasis on the color orange on it as well. So it's been, it's, it's a triangle in the middle of an existing and future residential zone. So in term, terms of urban design, urban fit, well-functioning urban environments and so forth, what particular attributes are of the site that, that contribute to a well-functioning urban environment, apart, apart from potential proximity to the wider town centre? I think the, um, there are controls in the, the planning provisions in terms of architectural uh, design and colours and signage that will, um, so any, any building or structure proposed on the, on the area would be a restricted discretionary activity with the matters of discretion relating to urban design. Um, so those controls are still in place to ensure that you will get an appropriate design for, for a residential area. So, so there's going to be an, an assessment of the architectural design merits of the buildings themselves through the RDA process. Yes. And you consider that sufficient to, de to deal with any architectural qualitative concerns that may be raised Yes, I do. And I think the, as Mr. Milne alluded to, the landscape treatment that's proposed is, um, I've heard it described as an urban forest, um, is quite tree heavy. Um, and that combined with the setbacks will provide, I think, a high, a relatively high level of amenity for a 
a large format retail. But the dominant features are the buildings as opposed to the car parks and the trees, though, aren't they? Uh, in the short term, I think once the, um, once the landscape establishes, um, the, uh, the, the trees will be. Uh, but again, I'd, I'd have to assess it, assess it again against the um, medium density aspect that noting that that site will, the openness of that site will, will change. It won't, won't be there. You know, potentially we will have up to 11 metre high residential buildings on that site. Uh, so in, in a built form point of view, uh, the buildings will be larger, but the scale of those buildings is not, won't be out of character with, with medium density zone. Hmm. Well, pro approximately, I possibly could have found this out if I dug deep enough, but approximately what height is the building of the consented packing site? It, it, it does vary, I think, but it, it's- At maximum. Maximum. Is it 11 meters? Yes. Mm. That, well, and that's why I expressly said there will be an element of yellow in it. So without, yeah, okay, no, that, that, that's all good. Um, and it, it will be safe to assume that the, the scale of any proposed building in terms of height, bulk, massing and so forth, which will, which will be considered an RDA would be approximately the same height as the consent back and so on. Do we know yes. that? Yes. There, yeah. yeah, you might not know, but. It's considering What's your height? recent might attends, I'm aware of, you know, they can can be a pretty substantial building. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, just a couple of matters. CO twenty seven. The last sentence. You say it's probable a residential development would turn its back on both roads due to amenity concerns. That's not my um, non-expert casual observation of how subdivisions in Rolleston, Lincoln and Prevleton have actually occurred. They Houses that front even the busy roads still just have low fences or no fences at all yep. and maybe a few little shrubs and things, but they certainly don't turn their backs on the road. So I'm not, I didn't quite understand what you were yeah, trying to say um, there. No, that's probably a fair comment, sir. Um, when I was looking at Rolleston, it's, it does actually um, interact well with its with its busy roads. Yeah. Um, I guess the aspect I'm trying to get across is that 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 road network is going to get busier and busier, um, and the environment's changing all the time. Um, so as development occurs. We, we do find in a lot of subdivisions, and even though we do have strong fencing rules and requirements to prevent that over time, you will get people developing their site and, and sometimes high fences go up. Um, and it does tend to happen quite often on busy busy roads just because they lose that, that amenity in their front yard. Yeah, uh, the PDP has quite stringent provisions on, on fencing, as you probably will Yeah, yeah, and I, I think that's a good thing. I, I, I think it's, we're trying to address that. I, sometimes though so it's um, it's good if we can avoid those aspects in the first place where we, we actually look for a less sensitive activity to occur on a on a busy intersection. So we don't then have to try and control fencing. Yeah. And just two more questions. This the next one's right in your right the next paragraph down 28 you talk about the commercial development has a potential to improve the legibility and walkability of the area. Understand walkability but legibility just lay Without any kind of urban design jargon, what does that mean in lay terms? I get, in terms of just a most intersections in Rolleston, you'll note they'll have they're just residential activity on all four corners, yep. um, and so they all look exactly the same. And it's it is quite easy to get lost in Rolleston. The fact that we're putting a different activity on a on a corner site, uh, on a prominent corner site, then just just changes the the character of that 
of that site and gives gives the area a bit more legibility. Yeah, yeah. So legibility, I'm still. Oh, so yeah, it's um, it, it's almost just um being able to understand the place and and be able to find your way around. Um, so then when people are talking, I say, "Oh, I met you at Pack and Safe." You know, right. it's actually become the legible landmark. It's more to assist with people's navigation around the county. Yes, yeah, right. exactly. Okay. Now we just heard from um, someone sitting in the back row there that the pack and save is going to have a predominantly charcoal coloured facade, so different to the pack and saves that I'm familiar with. Um, with a mitre 10, um, will it have a similar um, charcoal facade with a minimal amount of orange or will it just be a typical great big huge orange building like we see elsewhere? I'm, I'm not sure of the, um, obviously that will be addressed through the, the RDA process. Um, I am familiar with ones in Queenstown um, at um, Frankton Flats um, and so they, they have different colour requirements. Yep, I'm aware there. of that one as well. Yeah, yep. um, so it's possible and, um, and I'd, I'd see a similar uh, treatment or um, approach taken. And do the planning provisions that have been um, suggested to us by the planner for this case enable a decision maker to impose that in the absence of a of the of the mitre ten people wanting to do it? Uh, I think I think they do. I think there's enough control in there, but that that's probably Miss Colley's area of expertise. Um, And that would be through an RDIS, did you say? Yes. All right, thanks. That's all I have for you. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Now, I think we might, now that's a good time. We'll break for morning tea and we'll break for 15 minutes or so. Just and we break we'll come back. I did actually just get Miss Parrish to bring the consented plans and put them up there. Yeah. Um, and I guess this is the point that I was trying to make that what we're doing is more equivalent to what you would see in a town centre local centre as opposed to a large format centre. This is what's been consented and it's these conditions that have been put through to the planning, the provisions that have been proposed and on the ODP. Um, it's very much different, I guess, what we would all have in our mind when you think of a large format retail zone. And that's why my words earlier were, call it what you want. I think we've got a limited range of zones to call it within Wollaston and what we're looking for is a site specific zone that would apply to this site and I think the expert evidence is, is that that's needed because of how it's considered. Yeah. yeah definitely don't think big gap though. All right we'll break for morning tea and we'll come back at 10.45 or thereabouts.
Uh, just before we um, hear from the next witness, sorry, can you hear me? Yep, just returning to the matter of the scope, obviously we had some concerns, we put them to you verbally, I uh, may or may not have articulated those well, and you've responded verbally, but it'd be really helpful for us if you could prepare a, a, a memorandum where you step through in a huge amount of detail why you think we have scope referring to the specific provisions of the Enabling Housing and Supply Act and just step it through um, as if you're giving a lecture to like a primary school class or something, just break it right down. And if you could do that, <clears throat> and then because obviously um, this is a quite a different process with no merits-based appeals, unless the council rejects our recommendations, um, but obviously appeals on legal matters, what we would then do once we receive that memorandum from you is we will seek a, a, an opinion from council solicitor, and then we'll look at that and then we'll decide if, if we're happy with the scope issue or not. So I think that's only fair in terms of process that we do that. Yep. And in terms of timing, what do you think the timing would be for a memorandum from you of that nature? Um, I will do this as soon as I can. Yeah, no, that's great. Okay, right, and then with that we can, so are you happy with that? I don't need to do a minute asking you to do no, that. No, 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 that's fine, that's fair. And I think I'll, I'll tell you to do the rest and suggest that I'll put those comments on the screen in the Yeah, yeah, and pad them up as, as much as you are able to. Pad them out, I mean. All right, so let's have the next witness. Mr. Johnson's an architect and he put together, based on operational and functional matters, a plan for all the experts to consider when they were looking at how this would work in terms of um, the design on the site. And so he is really just available for any questions on perhaps a trade retailer or specific nature and, and he doesn't intend to present. Okay. So, so when you say trade, real, real, trade um, retailer, my understanding is that we're actually we're looking at a Mitre 10, aren't we? Yes, we are. And there's a contract in place which requires yeah. a Mitre 10 next door, but because of the zone, um, the words trade retailer has been used to be consistent with yeah. the proposed sale and district plan. And is it a traditional mega Mitre 10? Or? No. It's, um, and Ms. Actually, Ms. Smith could probably pop up with the architect and you could talk together uh, and he's available to answer questions. But you know, his idea is that this would be a retail. That's how it works because a trade is based in town. I'll, I'll actually get you to address it if that's right, Mr Smith. This is Mr Smith, he's been yeah. with uh, Maritain in Christchurch for yeah. many years. Yeah, 40. So Mr Smith, just while we have you and Mr Johnson, the architect at the table, if you could maybe initially just outline to us um, in terms of you proposing a Maritain on the site, what that might end up looking like. Um, well, it's not as big as a mega. Um, it's a smaller footprint. It would be um, it would be quite a big garden, open garden sort of area. Um, I'm trying to describe it, I suppose, in <coughs> terms. It'll be quite a nice big garden, outdoor area on the end of it. It'll have a mid-sized box and a bit of a drive-through at the end, pretty much. Yeah. Uh, cladding and colour scheme. Well, we're still working through those, but you know, with the corporate, but the um, the cladding's traditionally just on. And well, you might better talk to that better. Yeah, so there, there is scope within the Mighty Team Group for changes and variation within their standard palette. Um, and that's evidenced by uh, Wanaka and uh, Queenstown stores. Mm -hmm. uh, and the group recognizes that uh, moving into these smaller provincial areas, they've got to be more responsive to that sort of thing. Um, and I believe they're in the process of actually um, setting up uh, within their framework, the ability to do so. So they're taking a proactive approach to it basically. And so we have these diagrams of what the pack and save might look like. Uh, would the Mitre 10 have a similar appearance? Uh, I couldn't speak to that at the moment. The building hasn't gone into any sort of detailed design. It's been high level for ODP essentially. Um, but as I can speak to the ones that we have done where we have um, modified the standard palette and that would be Wanaka where it's, it's yep. uh, the traditional form and colouring has been changed uh, to respond to a sensitive location. 
Uh, so, and we would see it progressing in that sort of way, Murray. All right, and Mr. Uh, Johnson, you're happy to go straight to questions. Mr. Smith, did you want to say anything by way of summary in terms of your evidence, or are you happy if we just go to questions as well? Yeah, he, he's just available for questions, and it might be easier okay. for both of them. But, no, no, that's good. That's fine. So, Raymond, any questions for either of these two gentlemen? Yes, I have one for Mr. Smith, I think it is. The one with the Māori pen that I'm most familiar with is the one in Rangiora. Oh, yes. Is that similar? Will that be similar to what will go on the site? That's, that'll be bigger. The Rangiora is bigger than, the, um, than what we're looking at here. And the garden area... The garden it, area would a be a feature of commodity. Yes, that would be that's the garden area would be similar. And you're going to you're going you're going to store and include all the children's activities on the weekend that you do at your Mitre store ten stores in Christchurch. Absolutely, yeah. So we being part of the community is our biggest thing, really. So we we've got Papanui and Hornby, um, and we run. Um, we've got an enormous play. <laughs> Area in there, which is bigger than the, which we plan to put into the to this one. It's about a four meter high, slidey thing. Makes McDonald's look so uh, it's quite small. <laughs> and that's next to the cafe, so we get the local um, groups. We've actually been getting quite a few um, old people cycling groups. Actually, <laughs> seems to be what we get in our cafes turning up and visits from the people with their rest homes with their parents. And th those are sort of the community things. Yeah. Um, my, my grandchildren have attended some of the weekend activities that might attend have, and they really enjoy it. So, yeah. Um, yeah, no, Definitely, we'll, we'll be involved in that program. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. No, thank you. I probably shouldn't say this, but at the risk of introducing some humour into the process, um, in terms of the Mitre 10 and Napier, it's my favourite shop and it's my wife's least favourite shop for obvious reasons. <laughs> you pass it on to Steve. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Very good. Very um, good. No, no further questions from was, me for either of you. I was just going to get you to uh, put Murray how you explained to me about your trade and your retail, and this is more, more emphasis on retail as opposed to trade. Oh, yeah, sure. Um, so, so the we, we have the um, the store in Hornby, which is one of the bigger Mitre 10s in, in the group, and that currently actually is the, um, you talked before about being 15 minutes down the road, or well, we're 12 minutes down the road from this new site to where the well, Hornby is, and that does a lot of the heavier trade, and we're also putting in a, um, a ded dedicated trade distribution centre down Shands Road, which would... Um, so the heavier sort of end of the business, if if we did that, would come from a, an offsite location. This a mighty ten store is more focused around the retail and sort of the community people, just local to the the, the customers, I suppose. Yeah. And that's where the, the cross. Um, that's why I'm pretty excited about this opportunity with um, with pack and save because the cross shop ability of it is is excellent. All right, Lindsay, well, any questions for either? No, I think she's. No. Right, thank, thank you very much. Okay. Who have we got left? Mr. Mether or now, transport. We've got Mr. Mether on and then Ms. Collie. Is that all we've got, oh, Mr. Yes. And then Mr. Allen. So three more. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh, and this, any questions for Ms. Parrish as well? Uh, good morning. Um, you'll recall me from yesterday. Um, so I was just going to step through the executive summary and um, point to a couple of key points um, as well. Um, I've got quite a few figures in the um, as an attachment to my evidence. Um, they sort of help to tell a little bit of the story as well. Um, so the site's um, located uh, on Lincoln Rolleston Road and Levi Road intersection, so the um, arterial roads. Uh, Levi Road sort of had an increasing function with since the Southern Motorway um, has come online, uh, and Lincoln Rolleston Roads, um, I guess it's increasing function as well. So when we're looking at sort of how this site will integrate, we need to look a little bit longer term and 
um, understand what sort of future traffic volumes um, might be there. Um, the council's planning to upgrade the intersection um, to a traffic signal in the next year or two. Um, and the pack and save consent that um, is on the site um, that has a requirement that if that signal hasn't been undertaken that they have to modify the roundabout to increase capacity to deal with the existing um, traffic queue in the PM peak on Levi Road. Uh, as part of the pack and save consent, um, there was pretty extensive uh, transport engineering input. Um, I wasn't involved in that process, but I've reviewed that process and uh, um, it basically provided for access to both roads, but it did have um, some restrictions on those access um, provisions. And that was to sort of, I guess, manage the effects of access onto an arterial road, but also um, in terms of sensitivity with other um, or proximity to intersections and activities on the opposite side of the road. Uh, so those have been brought through to the ODP for this site. Um, the proposed zoning obviously includes the trade retail now as well, and that's been the focus of my evidence is the step change from that, um, from the pack and save up to pack and save and a trade retail. Uh, I've adopted the same methodology that was used for that consent process in terms of the traffic modeling. Um, and you've found that the uh, changes in performance uh, were quite small. And one of the reasons for that is that um, uh, trade retail, a lot of the traffic that's um, generated by it, uh, particularly in the PM peak or the evening um, peak of the road network, which is most critical, um, are trips that are already on the transport network somewhere else. So either passing by or um, nearby. So only about a third of the um, traffic generation is usually new trips that are going directly um, or making their primary purposes for that um, trade retail trip. So the effects are sort of, uh, it's, I guess that helps manage effects in a way during the peak period, but it also, um, when you're looking at the location on the strategic network, you've got access to those um, movements where people are basically already passing by with reasonably high volume. So then it becomes more of an issue of um, access to the site. Uh, the site's already well serviced by public transport. There is public transport routes um, that are uh, going pretty much through the Levi Road, Lincoln Rolleston Road intersection. Um, and so there's uh, two routes there um, over time. Uh, those routes will change and that's the so regional council's responsibility to modify that and as part of a consent process it would be a need to consider through high trip generator assessments what the um, bus stops that might be required um, so we haven't included that level of detail onto an ODP but it's certainly um, a very accessible site for public transport. It's also within walking distance of the town centre and the bus interchange there as well. So in terms of staff movements or people being able to access um, the trade retail, there's that opportunity. Uh, it's also got, I've also set out in my evidence, um, some catchments for cycling uh, and it's within reasonable cycling distance of pretty much the whole of Rolleston. And over time that network's developing as well. Uh, and the walking catchment, it's got residential around it um, on uh, a couple of sides at the moment. And um, you've got PC71 um, and behind, so that sort of increases that walking catchment as well. Uh, and it's, I guess, maybe a distinction from um, the other site or for large format retail is that it's sort of a, it's you know, more of a residential um, and town centre type traffic rather than heavy industrial um, traffic so some some advantages there and it just adds to overall sort of travel choice and um, trip efficiency um, so sort of step through the details of the ODP and what I think is required to support um, the proposed development and um, you've just heard from Mr Johnson um, the what we've sort of assessed in terms of access provision is largely based on a concept that um, might attend think is deliverable. Um, and so it provides shared access with pack and save on Lincoln Rolleston Road. 
uh, and additional supporting access. Um, and those accesses would be addressed through um, a resource consent process um, because this will trigger the need for a high trip generator assessment and um, at basically any level of uh, ITA that's required or integrated transport assessment, you would have to consider the access, how it provides for different mode choice and effects on um, those local sort of intersections and um, frontage roads. And the pack and save, I guess, another thing they had was um, a requirement to um, contribute to upgrades and a change in uh, form on Lincoln Rolleston Road. So expect that if the site expands south, then something similar um, would be required. So you, uh, when you're talking about legibility with Mr. Compton Moen, um, if you've got the Broadlands Drive, comes a roundabout in the future or long, longer term, and you've got the traffic signals at Levi, Lincoln, Rolleston Road, then that section between um, those intersections becomes more consistent and legible as a, a frontage to this type of development. Um, no, I guess I'd probably just leave it at that, really. I mean, I think that, yeah, broadly the sites um, are reasonably well located next to the arterial network, and um, it also offers the opportunity to minimize transport on that wider network. Um, some of the alternative locations are a lot further to travel to, so that just reduces vehicle travel generally. All right, <clears throat> we'll see if we have questions for you, Amy. Yes, I do. Um, at your paragraph 74, you talk about my team's busiest period being late Saturday mornings. You know what? <clears throat> just the supermarket. <clears throat> Excuse me, sorry. Does the supermarket have a busier time than normal and will it clash with the late Saturday morning? So, so I guess from my experience, um, partly reviewing some um, supermarkets but and having a bit of involvement in some as well, is usually the focus at, from a traffic effects perspective has been on a, a weekday, but when we look at the weekend, uh, a supermarket often still builds up more comparably or similar to a weekday and their peak would often still be later in the day. Um, so that's, you know, I guess, some examples, but I think that, yeah, that and the, the level of traffic generation on a weekend from a supermarket isn't necessarily particularly higher than a traffic generation on their weekday, whereas for a trade supplier, it will be higher on a weekend. I presume that that is that cumulative build up of traffic has been assessed. Yeah, so um, I've included the figure and uh, figure, just give you the reference, figure 15 in my evidence um, showed that for, on a weekday, um, as I've pointed out in my evidence, because you're going to be triggering a high trip generator assessment anyway. Um, I haven't gone into further detail about that Saturday, but I have explained why I think that the weekday evening peak period is still the critical period for assessment, even though it's not the busiest time of the um, trade supplier, but it will be the sort of most critical time period for the road network. Thank you. Um, you mentioned in your summary, and sorry, I, I can't get your evidence in front of me, um, but uh, that the intersection upgrade Levi Road is proposed to be signals or potentially putting in a bigger roundabout. Council's got it on its LTP, I understand from yesterday, uh, to be done very soon or within the next couple of years anyway. So is there no certainty about whether it's going to be signals or roundabout at this point, um, particularly in terms of the level of traffic assessment that would have been required for the, for the pack and save proposal at resource consent stage? So I think the level of certainty was that it will be, um, the council has put in their um, long-term plan and the annual plan, there'll be traffic signals. Um, and the way that it was being assessed at the pack and save was that obviously they were potentially going to be building that um, ahead of those traffic signals. Yeah. So then they needed to consider uh, what the implications would be if they 
came in ahead. And so right. they looked at it with a roundabout as well and uh, proposed a mitigation measure, which is a condition of consent that if the signals aren't in, then they would add in another approach lane on Levi Road to the roundabout until those become signals. But my understanding is that part of the reason that that is being brought forward in, in the draft annual plan proposal um, to traffic signals um, in the next financial year is because uh, foodstuffs is um, a part of the uh, the process of delivering that. Yeah, so there's a development agreement presumably yeah. between to, to do that. Um, oh, yeah, I, I'm a, a little bit surprised that you know there's still this either or option when uh, certainly the evidence we had yesterday was that it's a really important intersection and it needs to have the appropriate intersection treatment and to deal with the turning traffic volumes then uh, signals will be preferable to the roundabout. Yeah, I think as I explained yesterday, um, the traffic models that are used to sort of determine the type of infrastructure have a longer term um, focus. So it essentially assumes every um, bit of uh, zoned land, or in some cases even potentially zoned land, has been fully developed to its full extent. So it's actually looking you know, 15 to maybe 20 years ahead. So that establishes the type of intersection that they want to build um, and that sort of sets, yeah, I guess, what they need to provide for that long-term traffic capacity. But in the interim, there was the option that if there was any uncertainty and it's a little bit like mm. the discussion, if, will it or won't it be built because of different reasons? Well, in this case, it's being brought forward um, and it will be traffic signals. Okay. Um, You've just quite a lot of emphasis in your evidence about the, the whole connectivity of the site in terms of cycling, walking, public transport and so forth. But considering the two offerings that there are on the site, one supermarket, one a trade retailer, and, and looking at you know experience elsewhere, particularly your own experience, is it realistic to actually put a significant emphasis on walking and cycling or indeed public transport when a lot of the products which are offered in both of the buildings here um, would be, be difficult to put them in your backpack and, and um, you know, walk some considerable distance? Is, is, is it... You know, is it fair to say that it's it's you're doing what what you need to do in terms of that, or is it a significant part, a component in potentially reducing travel demand, that which, or, or private vehicle travel demand, which needs to go to the the two buildings? Yeah, I mean, it's partly planning for yeah, it's planning for a choice for people to mm. have the option. Um, so if it's but you must, you've probably got some data though. Yeah, oh, in, yeah. in terms and, and of shopping trips to a pack and save, how many people, you know, actually utilise public transport, particularly in the Rolleston context, in Rolleston in 2023? Um, well, I think if you go past um, you know, the, the, the bus stops are out here, um, yeah, they're, they're actually, um, you know, very busy is my understanding of the um, those peak hour services mm. for people to use public transport at the moment because using a vehicle is getting more expensive. Um, in terms of the local um, sort of trips, well, that comes down to suitability of like, for example, for um, the bus service. So, what's the frequency? And that's something that that's ma that's the major investment of the region yeah. of the councils in terms of their funding at the moment. In terms of whether people will um, walk or bike you've heard from mr smith before that um you, you've got a cafe on there that generates people with um from cycling groups um the people will still potentially be biking past the site um for another sure. purpose so it's not a it's obviously a much smaller percentage but it's just a consideration and the government <laughs> policy is pretty much you know, driving towards wanting to make sure that you're not putting too many roadblocks in front in the district plan, then you know, yeah. all its provisions pretty much 
require transport assessments to make sure that it's accessible. It's not saying you must make sure that 20% of the customers are coming by bike, but you have to have the facilities there to be able to accommodate them. And that comes down to location considerations as well. Yeah, and, and what you're actually doing on the site and, and the projections will also determine how much on-site car parking can be accommodated depending on the size of the retail offering as well. Yeah. So it is it is very much designed for car based travel to both of those sites. So I just yeah, I just thought it was yeah, there was a reasonable emphasis in terms of public transport and cycling and walking and your evidence. But in, in, in reality, it'd be fair to say that the vast majority of trips to both of these particular facilities will be by private vehicle. Yeah, the vast majority of trips are, and um, I guess that sort of follows the, the population and, you know, most yeah, people drive to are. work still. Uh, yeah. It is what it is. But, yeah. And okay. uh, certainly staff, yeah, they're not bringing material to yeah. site, but they may want the option to cycle. And you know, the council's developing a network with the intention that it's there if people are doing it and try and make it as safe as possible because, you know, that local intersection, um, where I've referenced um, crashes, two of the crashes were related to cyclists or two or three of them in the last couple of years. So you know, yep. it's an issue that needs to be considered. Yeah, okay. Last question is, uh, obviously there was a, a lot of work done in terms of design, traffic design, potential roading configuration changes getting into and out of the pack and so. So is there any localised widening required to get the right turn pockets to have one, two, three, four, five overall intersection points onto Lincoln Wollaston Road? Is, is, yeah. is, is it's all achievable within the width that's available or potentially within the, app, the application site or the, the site that we're talking about? Yeah, I, I, I think it's all very achievable. Um, the I've set out in my evidence um, how my expectation is that the treatment in front of Pack and Save, something similar, would probably find its way further south. There's mm -hmm. no roads as such proposed along the trade supplier part of the site on the opposite side, so it will be more vehicle accesses. Um, there's a couple of right of ways with the subdivisions that have been um, either consented or going through the consent process. So they the things that would be considered as actually positioning those accesses but I think in terms of including those on the ODP at the moment that just helps with a bit of certainty um, for everyone going yeah. forward um, and I guess in terms of anything that could be a bit more difficult it's probably just uh, a little bit like the Levi Row frontage how you manage pedestrians across a higher traffic um, access and whether there would need to be an easement within the site or not for yeah. a pedestrian yeah. footpath. And, and you're proposing quite a separation between the heavies that go into the site and the remainder of the traffic as well. Yeah, so uh, I, from the, for the Mitre 10 part of it, the strategy for service vehicles is that they would be using um, the Link and Rolleston Road primary access, which is at the moment for the back and safe consent, that's exit only. Mm -hmm. For Mitre 10, uh, given that there's two different land uses the expectation is that that would probably be the entry only and then they would go around the back of a building and then come back out onto Lincoln Rolleston Road by their own dedicated service access and that's largely a function of um, trying to manage the security of the two separate back of house parts of those buildings and, and it would be a matter that would be considered rather through resource consent stage. Okay. Thank you. Just following on from some of those um, issues that Commissioner Daesh raised with you, as you're aware, for um, most other rezoning proposals that come in front of us, where they all have the major traffic implications. And as you're aware from yesterday's hearing, there's at least three intersections in the vicinity of this area, where as a result of proposed residential rezoning, there's issues and there's Upgrading of those intersections are, are required as a result of the residential zoning alone. So I, when you prepared this evidence, did you liaise at all with Council's traffic expert, Mr Collins, in terms of getting some kind of peer review done of what you've done in your assessment? Well, I attempted to, uh, I, I contacted him last 
week, uh, last week, I think, just to check if he'd been engaged or not by the council because he'd been, obviously, the appropriate consultant he said he hadn't been. Yeah. Um, I did, though, as part of, at the very start of this process of my assessment for the MITRE 10, um, I talked to the council's, um, I think he's called a strategic um, transport planner, Andrew Maisie. He's previously the um, sort of asset manager and sort of has a fairly good understanding of what's going on in Rolleston. And his primary comment was, a, and I at the time I was seeking access to use the transport model, but his primary comment at the time was about making sure that the Broadlands Drive um, extension is provided for through the ODP and that their expectation was that that will be around about in the future. And so I've set out in my evidence how a roundabout at that location um, might influence access, um, but from the um, yard effectively of um, the trade supplier site. So that was his focus of, you know, or comments of discussion at the time. All right, thank you. No further questions from me. Yeah. Who's next? Would it be useful just to talk about that Broadlands Drive extension and how that's come into the documents through the variation one? So it's not in the operative plan. The ODP for the site is a C shape uh, where you just drive in and out onto that main uh, Lincoln Rollison Road, isn't it? Plan change 71 has a requirement that they need a link through land to connect to Council's Broadland Drive um, to be able to create their residential activity. So they pulled Foodstuff Site, 157 Levi Road, which wasn't owned by Foodstuffs at that time, into the Plan Change 71 process. So the 157, 157 Levi Road, the site you're considering now, was pulled into Plan Change 71 process, notified with Plan Change 71. Considered as part of Plan Change 71, the pack and save wasn't on the site at the time, so there wasn't an ability to talk about the future land use. And through that process, they put connections into uh, the site of foodstuffs in a different way to what it was under the operative plan, which is the proposed Southern District Plan is in the proposed Southern District Plan as notified. And they added a Broadfield Links Drive. Now, Foodstuff's position at that time at Plan Change 71 is we're not going to let you through our land. We don't want the connections. Um, and the commissioner thought it was incredibly important that that Broad Links Live uh, connection go through that bottom of the site. And I think there was some acknowledgement in the ODP that the other connections may not be able to be given effect to if there's a future activity. When it was notified as part of Variation 1, it included the Broad Links Drive, which is not otherwise included in the proposed Salmon District Plan as notified um, as an essential connection to enable the residential development on Plan Change 71. And it included the two other links um, through to where the pack and save is now, um, which wouldn't be provided through rezoning the site and enabling this proposal. But what the applicant has done, acknowledging how essential that link is to residential development beyond the site, is it is proposing that that link, the broad link, broad, Broadlands Drive link continues to remain on the ODP. Confusing, I know. <clears throat> so looking at um, DDR01 and the PDP, are you talking about what's shown as the, and there's a black ring road, are you talking about those little gray roads that come? Yeah, the two it? little bits that have been added. Yeah. So they've been added by Plan Change 71 and notified as part of Variation 1, yep. but they don't exist in the proposed Salmon District Plan as notified. And then can you see the bit at the bottom on the bottom of the triangle? Mm -hmm. There, so that's the essential link that Mr Maisie from the Council has been referring to and which um, Mr Meadoros just referred to. That's the link that triggers the enablement of further development on Plan Change 71. They've got a baseline level of residential activity that can occur on that site, but they can't develop it any further until they go through that link. So that's the little curvy bit in the apex. Yeah, it's actually problem. a critical key piece of um, infrastructure for the council, which we are offering as part of the proposal to rezone 
despite there being, as you can see from our ODP, no need at all for the activities to use that link. Our site would be disconnected. That link would be provided to enable the residential activity behind us. Okay. And that's shown on Mr. Metherall's page 35 or 42 as the little black oh. arrow with an arrow on each end of it. Yes, and then you might like to talk about how you've aligned it correctly because it's been aligned in different ways. And is that what you're calling the Broadland? What's that called? What do you call that? So Broad Broadlands Drive is the road that further west goes past the aquatic centre in high school and yep. loops back around to Lowe's Road. And so that block of land directly opposite. Um, so I've got figure three in my evidence. Sorry, I don't have the page number of the PDF. Um, that shows what's there at the moment. That's a council site and they, they have indicated a plan to sort of develop that um, Broadlands Drive extension in the longer term. Uh, but yeah, Ms. Booker um, mentioned that there's a bit of misalignment between there's three ODPs that have a connection and they're all a bit misaligned. Um, I've put in um, the proposed ODP for this site uh, at figure 14, the mm -hmm. location that I think it needs to be, and that would allow for a suitably sized roundabout um, and sort of space, I guess, for um, corners and that. Ideally, the other ODP should align with that. Yeah. And I need to go back and check, but I don't recall that the Plan Change 71 proponents made a submission on that area. Um, they were only focused on their site, but the council through variation one notified that re revised ODP across foodstuffs land. So that's the point I made earlier with Mr. Cleary that this is a live the site is live and under consideration in the variation one. All right, who should we have next? Thank you, Commissioners. Um, my name is Rebecca Parrish. I represent Foodstuffs South Island and Foodstuffs South Island Properties. Um, in summary, um, I just thought I'd update you on where we're at with the resource consent and how we're proceeding on site. Mm -hmm. um, we, we have the resource consent for the pack and save. Um, we are reviewing the design to reduce the height of the building down and make it even, even smaller. <laughs> Um, currently through detailed design and we're working towards um, <clears throat> lodgement of building consent and um, that's being advanced at pace. This, is, this project for foodstuffs is its number one priority um, so we're moving through design as fast as we can. Um, we've fully engaged with a, a suite of consultants to undertake that and um, they've all been fully engaged on site. When you drive past the site it looks like nothing's happened. Um, it's because they're all working in the background, um, but we have undertaken due diligence on site with regards to contamination and geotechnical um, and engineering and civil works and, and, and everyone's moving through that design phase at the moment. So we aim to launch the building consent as, as expediently as we possibly can. Um, that's that's um, very, very high on our priority list. Um, and we've also um, entered into a development agreement with Selwyn District Council with regards to the, the level of um, commitment and cost sharing and works um, undertaken on Lincoln Wollaston Road and on Levi Road. Um, that includes um, introducing a shared pathway at our cost, introducing a footpath at our cost, um, undertaking a, a proportion of um, of course, share in regards to my understanding is um, a, a full set of lights, um, not a roundabout, um, but that's that's what we've heard from council. You know that hasn't, yeah. Um, but it is a full intersection design, um, and to then end, council did ask us to lodge a submission in support of the annual plan, and we've done that to to advance the the intersection further forward. Um, what's what would be 
fantastic for both parties, both cell and district council and foodstuffs, is for construction to occur um, at the same time. So the construction on site at the Pack and Save would occur at the same time as the construction on the road network so that disruption for the community is minimised. Um, we've been through situations post earthquake in, in Canterbury where we've built, replaced a supermarket and then the council, it was Skirt at the time, have come along and, and then done six months worth of roadworks out on the road. So we've learned our lesson um, and, and we're really trying to um, engage the process as, as a two-way partnership. It's much better for the community and, and would be so much better for the disruption of, um, or, or potential disruption of Levi Road because it's so busy. Um, so, so there's a, re a real genuine commitment there between council and, and foodstuffs. Um, if I turn, turn now to the, to the Mitre 10 and Pack and Save um, developments, um, from, from our perspective as landowner, um, we have entered into agreement with Mitre 10 and um, we do feel that there's a really strong synergy between the two activities. They're both very much domestic, um, a domestic consumer or a domestic customer um, rather than a trade customer um, and that the everyday essential goods we see is in the general merchandise side and then in the grocery side. So really in a nutshell the simplicity of it is that the customer is the same. The vehicle that's arriving at site can do two different shopping and cross shopping events at the same time um, and there'll be really strong pedestrian connections between the two sites so that that, that can occur. And a really good example of that is Queenstown where Pack and Save and, and Maritina are aligned. Um, and it looks like it's the same site um, because the integration is there together. So you have a customer, that two customers that will arrive in one vehicle and, and then cross shop between the two, or if, if their wife doesn't like going to Mitre 10, but, <laughs> but you do, yeah. So um, that situation is, is quite common. Um, and in terms of the synergy, the look would look the same as well um, with the, um, intensification of the of the landscaping on site. Um, a question I, I, I strongly advocated for and, I, I, and in, as applicant I can be a little bit of an advocate um, is for the um, hedge to remain on site so through the, the resource consent process um, and um, through the design process of the landscaping I did ask the question can we retain that hedge because it's quite mature um, and it's a, I think it's Leyland Cypress or a Macacarpa hedge. Um, and, and, or can we retain some of it so you could have gaps in the hedge or instead of having one completely blanked hedge wall. Um, and Council's landscape architects did not want that. Um, they wanted the hedge removed. So we, we, we have got designs with the hedge in it and with it out. It was an iterative process. Um, the trees that are arriving on site when um, to support the, the pack and save and, and we envisage the same synergy with the minor 10, uh, our elders, um, Mexican and Italian elders that have been, um, it was council who asked for those that particular uh, tree species. Their height at time of planting is minimum four to five metres, so they are being grown at the nursery now, um, on grown at the nursery, they're, they're already um, in, in situ at the nursery. Um, they'll be in the nursery for two years, um, um, being looked after before they arrive at site. So they are really mature is what I'm, what I'm um, wanting to express to you commissioners is that the trees will be really mature. So at time of planting, they will be minimum four to five metres high. Um, at time of maturity, and they are, um, they will advance in height relatively quickly. You know, they will sit at around 12 metres high. So it will be quite a unique landscape um, on site. Um, now the soil structure at Rolleston is not great. Um, it's great for building on. A good gravelly site is the perfect site to build on from a geotechnical perspective. But from a landscape perspective, it's not. It's, it's really dry and, um, and, and very gravelly with the old riverbed running through there in, hundreds of years ago. So we are, it's through the consent conditions of the Pack and Save, um, importing structural soil and tree cells on site. And that level of investment is sitting at around half a million dollars, just for, not for the trees, just for the structural soil and, and um, and tree cells. So there is a high, a really high level of commitment from foodstuffs to ensure um, that the landscaping is, is quite unique on the site and, and really extremely high immunity. 
um, and then added to that is, is the significant amount of tree species and full irrigation on site as well. Um, and that is that is that landscape plan sits with the yeah structure plan. That's correct, isn't it? Oh, yeah. it's just time is yeah. gone, but I think the reason we fell on the landscape option we did was that it was consistent with what had been envisaged in a Rollis construction plan with the avenues of trees. Yeah, which is why that was their preference as opposed to the fledged hedge that we were sort of going to block out the building more for the neighbours. Yeah, yeah, and um and. Council urban design, um, councils urban designers and landscape architects have all been involved in that, that landscape plan design. Um, that's the best way to get the best outcome. And the yeah, yeah, and the neighbours. Yeah, um, to have all, all contributions put forward. Um, we began with the landscape plan of having mountain beach because they're durable, and we thought if we're going to go hard, we'll go real hard and put mountain beach in because they look amazing. But council did say no, we prefer elders in this situation, so so we've run with that. Um, there is an extremely high level of commitment to ensure that the community is comfortable with the pack and save. Um, the colours, the textures, um, the design matters on the architectural treatments of the building. Um, there's a high level of glazing. Um, Council um, sought that. Um, really recessive colour scheme, um, very limited yellow. Um, and it's a very similar type design as Queenstown. The Queenstown situation, I keep referring back to that, that is because that's the most sensitive location in all of New Zealand, sitting underneath the Remarkables. Um, and, and Rolleston's design um, is very similar to Queenstown, if not more advanced than that in terms of um, the cuteness to the environment. And it's Rolleston, and, 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 and um, you know, comparing that with sitting under the Remarkables, we have a high level of immunity, we believe. Um, I believe that's, yeah, that's all the, the little snippets. <laughs> Thank you, I see we have questions, Raymond. That's all right, yeah. Lindsay. No, thanks. <clears throat> Just one question from me, I put to um, someone earlier on in the day, uh, why do you need this um, rezoning if you already have a consent for the site? And the answer was, well, sometimes we need to change our design and that requires um, changes to the consent. <clears throat> I imagine that's reasonably common. Um, from your experience where that occurs, is that usually a non-notified process that happens fairly readily or is it fully notified or what's your experience of you needing to go back and change consent conditions? Very, very pertinent question, sir. Um, my, my role is within the South Island, so I look after all the consenting <laughs> procedures within the South Island for yep. foodstuffs. It's a variety of different councils. Um, and um, it is certainly not uncommon for to have two or three um, variations to a consent mm -hmm. as we run through that design process. Um, and that, that can occur due to site changes or to um, value management or to like doing things like trying to reduce the, the bulk of the building. Mm -hmm. um, it's really tricky, really uncertain to go through that process. It delays the program um, design <coughs> build puts the building consent out, it puts the, um, it increases the construction costs. And we're talking millions and millions of dollars um, in terms of construction costs. So a delay to, to an uncertain consent process um, can, can effectively cost, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, and that sounds very corporate, but it's not about that. It's about, you know, have um, the uncertainty creates a significant flow on effect for all those involved. Um, and, and whether that's um, limited notification, notification or, or non-notified, there's a real variety between those. Um, and uh, because we're in a, often in a non-complying situation. So, you know, the likelihood of it being non-notified um, is lower than the likelihood of it being, say, limited notification. And limited notification we've found in, in, in many circumstances takes just as long as public notification um, to run through that process. Um, yeah. So just um, roughly, and you may not know, but just if you had to say what percentage of these kind of um, consent variations go through non-notified, is it like mm. half or three quarters or a quarter, just that kind of ballpark? Yes, it would depend on um, it would depend on the situation um, and, and the level of um, of change that was needed. So sometimes it's a new consent, um, and sometimes it's a variation to the consent. If it's run through a limited notification process, um, that variation is about probably probably more highly likely to go through the same process again. Um, yeah, it does depend on the on the situation. Um, and, and 
it's not till we're sort of halfway through the process that we we you know receive that notification non notification decision as well. Um, did you want to add to that because you're often involved in those processes? Yeah, I was just thinking if we take a recent example, the Papanui Pack and Saves under construction at the moment. So that activity was a discretionary activity in the five foot, for consent. So it's had three variations, and each time they have to go back to the independent commissioner. We have to consider every single person who made a submission on that um, and then go through that process. So that's going to happen anyway, but I guess what we've got in Christchurch, different to Selwyn, is the plan rules are going to change underneath us. So when any variations go ahead from August 2022, they're not going to be the provisions that were considered at the time the consent was granted. So I guess that's a real uncertainty here. Yes. But I would say that you're quite often a limited notified to neighbours. You think Absolutely, about yeah. the head office, it's always yeah. the neighbours directly tend yeah. to get involved in that limited notification process. And it, um, I think you're going to get an easier ride with the provisions, but it's uh, in this particular instance, you're a non-complying activity with absolutely no anticipation of the activity. So it's just an awkward, I think an awkward exercise possibly. I don't think it'll change your notification to your neighbours, possibly, maybe not. All right. Uh, sir, sir, can I also add that um, you did make a comment um, or a question at one stage about whether Mitre 10 was able to locate within the Carter's land. Um, that my understanding is that Mitre 10 is not able to locate within the Carter's land. So that that has been denied. Right, thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, did think of the question. Yep. Um, you talked about the Queenstown pack and save setting up with Mighty Ten. Do you have any photos of that? Um, I don't have any photos with me, but I, we can get some within five minutes um, from Google. We can we can do that, um, or certainly we can send them through at a later stage. And just um, my second question, I probably should have asked the landscape Mr. Milne, but I'm asking to ask you. Um, so is there an intention that the Mitre 10 site will be look like the pack and save site? Yes. Like one landscape plan for both lots? Y yes, ma'am. It, it will look like um, it is a, it, it will present itself with the same level of high immunity. Um, um, and look, pa Papua Nui Mitre 10 is, uh, is amazing how... how um, how pristine and how high end the landscaping is to that site. Um, and my understanding is it's one many an award. Um, this is the same owner operator who will be at Hornby. Um, Mr. Smith. Um, yeah, it'll be high end immunity in the two Where is the Papanui site again? Um, it's not far from Northlands Mall. Um, so it's on the corner of Hewood Road and Surrey. Hewood Road and Chappie Street. It used to be the sanitarium. Um, I know where it is. Yeah, the sanitarium it yeah. It's gorgeous. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Thank you. We have the you. next witnesses. Two planners, is it? Yeah, they might be much too quick. Yeah, yeah. That's right. Might make more sense if my colleague goes first and then Mr. Allen, who was involved in the Pick and Save consent. Let's come here. Let you start off. Good morning. Um, my name is Ms. Colleague. I don't think I've appeared before you before. No. Nope. Um, so um, I, I'm the planner who's been engaged by Mitre 10 to consider the rezoning um, foodstuff submission sought an appropriate commercial zone to reflect that use of the site being the consented pack and save and the Mitre 10 store on the southern part of the site. Um, having reviewed the plan provisions, large format retail zone uh, had the best fit within the existing Selwyn district plan provisions um, and also uh, was appropriate to give effect to policy 3D and then NPS being an equivalent uh, zone to provide for commercial activities. Um, noting that the, the site is surrounded by residential activities and the existing large format retail zone 
within the plan is not. It is totally surrounded by industrial activities. Uh, some amended provisions are uh, necessary to protect the amenity of adjoining residential zones and ensure that the rezoning doesn't undermine the function and viability of the town centre zone in Rolleston. So what I refer to as the proposal, I've set out in, a, in attachment A to my evidence, which includes the re rezoning, the ODP, and the amendments to the proposed district plan provisions. These, um, the proposal's been assessed by expert evidence, um, which you've heard from economic transport, acoustic, urban design, and architectural experts. And their assessment demonstrates that the effects of the rezoning are appropriately managed by either the rules in the plan, uh, the amended provisions, or are acceptable. So I've assessed the proposal against the business land framework and the requirements of section 32 and the higher order planning documents in my evidence. Um, my overall, the proposal provides for additional business, la business land development capacity responsive to the growth of the Rolleston urban environment and the large amount of additional residential capacity that has been provided in Rolleston. The site's well located near the Rolleston town centre zone on the intersection of two arterial roads within a growing residential area and uh, very accessible by multiple transport modes. Uh, overall, I consider it's the most appropriate outcome for the site and more appropriate outcome than retaining the existing medium density residential zoning. Uh, it contributes to diversity of retail offering in the district and provides economic benefits while appropriately maintaining the amenity of surrounding residential zones and contributing to a well-functioning urban environment. Uh, my conclusion is that the rezoning is the most efficient and effective means of achieving the purpose of the Act and the relative and the relevant objectives of the proposed district plan and other higher order statutory documents. Thank you. Should we summarise? Must Alan too? That might be easier. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Good morning. Um, so my evidence is focused on the uh, consent at baseline established by uh, the Pack and Save Consent yep. uh, and the appropriateness of a zone and provisions to more accurately reflect that development outcome. Uh, and like Mr Milne, Mr Colgrove and Mr Hay, I was um, very heavily involved in the uh, initial conceptualising and, and preparation of that consent and the, um, the notified hearing process. Uh, as the plans show, um, on the board there and in front of you, the consent authorizer, it's a substantial supermarket development on approximately four hectares of the seven hectare site. Um, we've just heard Mr. Paris has confirmed foodstuffs will implement that consent and the steps that are being taken to commence construction I understand next year. Uh, in my view, there's a clear disconnect between the existing environment of the site as authorized by the consent and the development outcome that's anticipated by the proposed medium density residential zone for the site. <clears throat> residential activity will not occur on the consent portion of the site um, simply because of foodstuffs ownership and their clear uh, development intentions. The consent's illustrative of the manner in which commercial development can be appropriately accommodated on the site and integrated with its setting. All effects associated with the pack and save are comprehensively assessed through that resource consent process. And the consent decision actually found uh, the proposal to be consistent with the objectives and policies of the MPSUD, the regional policy statement, and in terms of the district plan, the operative proposed and also variation one at the time. Consent conditions were imposed for the express purpose of managing effects on the receiving environment. And there was a particular uh, emphasis on the residential interfaces, transport network, and the town centre. I consider the effects of recognising the pack and save development through a comparable zone and rule framework will be similar to those already deemed acceptable by the consent. The proposed large format retail zone amendments and accompanying ODP that uh, Ms. Colley has um, appended, will be effective in managing the nature, scale, and intensity of activities to ensure development is considerate of the receiving environment. The consent's consistency with the relevant policy frameworks, I believe, is equally applicable to the proposed rezoning of the corresponding site. 
The proposal more closely represents the development outcome contemplated for the consent portion of the site. And I believe it complements the consent in the most pragmatic of ways. I consider large format retail zone more appropriately reflects the environment authorised by the consent. Large format retail zone will better support the efficient development of the site for a supermarket. And by that, I mean the subsequent amendments, alterations, upgrades that inevitably occur. Uh, and it provides an opportunity to service the needs of the local community as well as future residents in an area which is clearly experiencing considerable growth. The relief sought aligns with the consent outcome and provides for the establishment of trade retail activity on the balance of the site as assessed by Ms Colley and the other experts. I consider that that large format retail zone tailored for the site provides the appropriate framework for proper consideration of future development. Overall, my assessment is that the site is suitable for large format retail zone in light of the consented environment that will soon become the established environment. Rezoning of the site in the manner requested will ensure the most efficient, effective and appropriate provisions are in place to achieve objectives of the plan and the purpose of the Act. It better reflects the existing environment of the site than the notified medium residential density zone and is considered the most appropriate zone. Thank you. Thank you. We'll see if we have questions. Any questions for the planners? No, no questions. No questions for the planners? Um, probably to Miss Colley. Can you can we go to your attachment one A, please? Just so I'm completely clear about what you're doing here. So it starts off with a new precinct description. Yes. Okay. And then nothing in CMUZ changes for a while until you get to the urban design matters and you've got an inclusion of an additional urban design matter and additional height matter. That's is, there, is, there, is there nothing within the existing provisions relating to CMUZ matter three, which isn't already covered by that? Were you just wanting to flick out that there's going to be a site specific solution to to development of this site? What's what's wrong with the, with the urban design matters which are in there already? Um, so the urban design matters in CMUZ and MAT3 are, um, are good and they will enable a um, consideration of the um, what the built form on the site looks like. And so coming back to the panel's earlier questions about the appearance of the building, um, corporate branding, the, the layout of uh, buildings and car parks on site, what we were really seeking to achieve with that additional point three is to um, enable council to consider the outline development plan that we've put forward and um, provide more certainty of outcome through this rezoning process. So we, the provisions that, that the, the amendments that I've made to the provisions are to provide for two large format, um, uh, one supermarket, one trade retail activity on the site and the expert assessments have been done on that basis. And so by pulling in this point three into um, map three that ensures that the built form on the site is limited to those two large buildings. Okay, so it's purely a mechanism in there to get to link to the ODP. Correct. So <coughs> would, wouldn't that matter apply to the other large lot residential zone? Oh, sorry, not large lot. My mind's fuzzy at the moment. Large format retail zone as well. Um, you know, you've You've, you've chosen to, to specifically add to the Jones Road site in the counter plan work section. We've picked out the site here, but wouldn't, wouldn't those, what, what would happen to the Jones Road site? So we'll just deal with, with the urban design matters as, they, as they're described. Correct, so only um, mat, um, points one and two would apply to the Jones Road site. Um, yeah. The way the mechanism for that is point three includes a reference to um, what I call Precinct Z, which is 157 Levi Road, and that is defined in how the plan works. Yeah. Um, Jones Road was um, through some of the evidence put through in the, I think it was the proposed district plan hearings, 
was allocated a precinct as well. Um, and so I've labelled that precinct X mm. in attachment A to my evidence. Okay. Um, um, just to be consistent with previous evidence on that Jones Road precinct. Okay. Turn over the page. We've got some highlighted sections. Is that is, should that be yellow highlighted or is it, it's grey highlighted? What's the what's the no, Commissioner, if I could refer you to the editing key um, on the front page of Appendix yeah. A. So grey oh, highlight yeah. indicates oh, yeah. changes recommended by the Council right of reply report. Yeah, oh, sorry, the, the, this is Mr. Oliver's right of reply report to the yes, CNU yeah. Okay, thank you. As long as it's printed in colour. Um, yeah. You'll have to correct um, that. And similarly, you're, you're wanting to um, add an additional objective Oh, sorry, policy um, under the large format retail. Was there nothing within the ob existing objectives that would be, you, you need to specifically carve out? This is an, an objective in the plan that actually relates to the entire activity classification as well. So you're wanting to site, site particularize the objective here by the inclusion of your PX. Yeah, so the objectives in the large format re, large format retail zone, uh, the objective um, and policy, um, I think, as they are written, suitably apply to this site. However, the existing large format retail zone in the plan is completely surrounded by industrial land. There's no real recognition of protection of amenity for adjacent re residential zoning which is why I recommend the addition of that new policy PX, which is about managing built form and layout within Precinct Z, which yeah. is only 157 Levi Road, to maintain compatibility with those adjacent residential zones. So, so, so it's, it's all about amenity considerations. Right? Correct. And, and because of the unique locational characteristics. And, and dealing site. with edge effects, which might otherwise not otherwise apply and potentially other sites. Correct. Okay. Um, more minor matter. Uh, rule four. You, you wanting in the inclusion of food and beverage activity located within the precinct as well. Aren't we being told it's a supermarket and a trade retail? And this is your yellow highlighted under LFRZ uh, for food and beverage activities. Yes, yeah, so I've sought to provide for the um, typical cafe internal to the Mitre 10. But that, that could be seen as being ancillary to the primary, though, couldn't it, as opposed to having a specific I, I think food and that, beverage? Because right. it's a, that, that, that indicates that there could be a separate tenancy located on the site as well. My understanding of, of the way it works, and perhaps this might be more of a question for Mr Smith, is that the, um, the cafes internal to Mitre 10 are separately owned and operated and would be yeah. a separate tenancy. Um, but you don't. You, you the, the ones I'm aware of. You go in through the shop, and then you, and yeah. then you, you, you know, It's not. They don't have a separate entrance or anything like that. No, no, they wouldn't have a separate entrance. I just wondered the necessity for actually flicking that out. Is it? Is it? Is it a belts and braces approach to what would normally happen at these? Just sometimes these... owned by, owned by um, another party. Yeah, but but. But we own we own the land. Yeah, no, no, I appreciate that, but it is ancillary to the to the main large format retail activity. Yeah, you wouldn't, you wouldn't, you potentially with that wording, you could put a fish and chip shop, a in fish, there. or so, something in in there about whether that's appropriate and whether that's the intent of the large format retail you, zone. You, it could be a minor matter, but um, you could so put I in a it, liquor land or a fish and chip shop <laughs> under those that wording, couldn't you? So I, I think it wouldn't be an unreasonable um, position for council to take if, if we, for example, were to lodge a resource consent application for a minor to 10 with an internal cafe, that that would comprise both a trade retail activity and a food and beverage activity. I don't think that there's anything in the trade retail um, activity definition that would encompass a business serving food and drink. So I think that if we that that is a probable outcome that that food and beverage activity would be regarded as a non-complying activity without those amendments in my evidence um, 
yes, it would be possible to put a fish and chip shop in there. Um, however, I don't think that there are any adverse effects arising of any different types of food and beverage activity in on that particular site. We've got things that are so, uh, so one solution. So uh, um, just so I'll, I'll come back to that point. So. Um, what we were seeking to achieve is to not allow a proliferation of lots of smaller food and beverage activities that could potentially take away from the town centre zone and be inconsistent with the key activity mm -hmm. centre framework, mm -hmm. which is why we've allowed for one and of quite a small footprint. Um, we could um, put in that it must be ancillary to yeah, we'll a retail activity, but I don't think that that's necessary. Okay. Well, that would be one, one way to resolve it, it is ancillary to the, to the main thing. Mm -hmm. uh, I know I, probably 18 months ago now we were looking at the CMUZ provisions and there was a lot of discussion at that time about food and retail and large format you know what metrics need to apply in terms of the size of it so there was quite a lot of discussion about about that in terms of undermining the, the sort of the role of the town centre by providing for more things than the LFR was designed to do. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I think, yeah, and then then pretty much you're doing a belts and braces with the other act to the other sort of land use categorisations there as well. Um, I don't have any further questions, um, and I don't have any for Mr. Allen either. So thank you. Thank you. I don't have any um, questions for the planning witnesses at this stage. I think just in terms of process going forward. Oh, sorry, that's no more witnesses, eh? No. No, no just in terms of process yeah. going forward. And we'll receive your memorandum setting out um, why you think there's scope. Mm -hmm. uh, we will then um, request council's legal advisor to give their opinion on that matter. We'll then consider the scope issue. If we think there is scope, what we will then do is direct the council to undertake a, a peer review of the evidence that's been presented to us, which would normally have occurred had the evidence been submitted with the original submission and you've outlined why you couldn't do that, which we understand. Um, and we will in that minute specify that the outcome of that is what we would expect to be a suite of joint witness statements that would identify areas of agreement and disagreement that will come back to us. And if we think we have scope to consider this on the merits, then we'll, we'll base that decision on the joint witness statements that come out of that process. I think that's the best we can do at this stage, given um, where we're at and how we would normally have received peer review advice on the proposal such as this. Yep. Yep. All right, so that's um, that's good. That's what we'll do. Um, we've asked your witnesses a few questions on the way through. So obviously through, if we decide there is scope, the issues that we've raised, no doubt those witnesses have um, taken notes of that and they can feed that into the peer review joint witness process as, as it goes forward, if it does. Thank you. And thank you for the panel for accommodating us over our time frame today. <laughs> yeah, that's all right. <laughs> All right, well, thanks very much for coming in and um, enjoy the rest of your day. So that brings us to the conclusion of this part of hearing number seven.